Bruno's <laughs> podcast. Uh, we have Jess Ledon. Is yeah, it not right? Close enough. Close, close enough. enough. Yeah. On American, say Loudon. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, buddy, how are you? Good, good. Thank you so much for coming over. Right now, we have a fan on. It's quite hot uh, here in the UK, but uh, we made it. You look very summery. I love the shirt. Thank you. So, yeah, listen, your, your uh, sense of style is incredible. Every, anyone who follows you on Instagram sees your photos are insane. <laughs> and then on top of it, there's a cigar, like, which is always really cool. Did you bring a cigar, by the way? No, I didn't. Yeah, I didn't. it's fine. Probably would die here anyways. <laughs> no, I'm going on vacation next week. And when I go on vacation, I smoke at least two or sometimes even three cigars a day. Okay. And then if not, I usually have about three a week. But that's only uh, over like four months in a year. Uh, when winter comes, I stop smoking cigars. Or I go to a club and stuff like that. So I don't really smoke that much. So how did the whole thing start? I mean, it started as a something to celebrate. Uh, you tried it once. You liked it. Did you smoke cigarettes before? Never. Never smoked cigarettes <laughs> And then cigar, you're just like, whoa. Yeah, I never smoke any cigarette. I never smoke any weed. Mm. And when I retired, when I was 40 years old, I was like, you know what? Let's try that. I always liked the smell of it, mm -mm -mm. but because I never smoked. And um, so I smoked it a couple of times. I was like, fuck, you know, that's a bit harsh, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but quickly, you like the smell of it. So initially, I was kind of puffy on it, but I liked to have it around to smell the mm -hmm, cigar. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And then eventually, you get used to it, and I start smoking it. So I've been smoking cigars since I'm about 14 now. Right, right, right. And then that makes us how long? How, long, how old are you About now? close to 10 years now. I'm going to be 50 this year. Hey, wow. 50, five big O. That's awesome. But you look amazing, man. Thank Easily you. can be 40. <laughs> Easy. Dude, I'm actually getting close to 40. I'm, I'm only a year away from it. I'm, I'm, how was it to turn 40? Fine. It didn't, it didn't even cross my mind. You know, even 50 now, I don't really care. Sometimes you think about it because the movie business, mm, uh, mm, mm. Is, I got a lot of friends of mine in Paris and they're 40 now and they try to change age and nobody's interested. Right, right, they're right. They're all looking to young, young yeah. actor, young actresses, 19, 20 years old. So when you come close to 40, 50, um, they expect you to be a veteran. Yeah. You're going to bring credibility to the movie. You're someone who should have 50, 60, you know, title. Um, and that's not the case for me. So, and the reason I was saying that is when you start having white hair and all those things, mm -hmm. you go to audition, people start saying, yeah, you know what, maybe it's too old for this role. And now you understand why nobody's got gray hair in Hollywood. Beside uh, Richard Gere and George Clooney, who, who has gray hair in Hollywood? Even I never really paid attention to that. Some of them are 75 years old. They got like pitch black soy sauce hair. You yeah, know what yeah. I mean? But you just say, like, uh, age is just a number. <laughs> Guys, age is just a number. No, no well, one cares. <laughs> I'd like to say that. I mean, recently, I had a stunt coordinator contacted me and he's doing a TV show, shot in Wales in Paris. And he said, I spoke to the director about you and he, he wants you to play a role. And it's, I think it's a French mercenary, so which fit me quite well. Yeah. And a producer came on board. And he was like, oh, no, no, no. I don't want that guy. He looks too old. So... Uh, you know, you never know. So sometimes that's what you think about. Me, I don't, I don't care about my age, but you realize that that's not how the industry sees it. So you feel a bit paranoid. Oh, should I dye my hair? Should I know? Mm -hmm, should mm -hmm. I get a name shorter? That's why I was shaving my head at one point because I was like, well, if I've got no hair, I don't have gray hair. Mm. Uh, but then eventually it gives you such a specific look. So I was like, oh, fucking, let, let me grow my hair again so I look softer. But, but as for my age, obviously I can't train the same way I used to. Yeah, uh, I'm not quite as fast as I used to. But besides that, I'm cool with it. Yeah, yeah. Just embrace it again. Like, do everything, all the things right. And then, like, for me, I can feel my training is like, I need just longer to recover. I still can do most of the things, but recovery takes a little bit longer. But then I've been doing now like, cold baths, saunas almost every day. Like, those things really help. And we know we have that knowledge. Um, so, yeah, actor, performer, UFC veteran. And uh, when you said, like, performer, I liked the, like, why did he put stunt performer? But uh, then I was like, oh, okay, you just widen the rage. Yeah, I can perform all sorts of things. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think performer because for different reasons. One, I don't consider myself a stunt performer. Mm -hmm. That's the first thing. I'm an actor that can do his own stunts. Right. I'm very good at fighting. Um, sometimes you've got to say things the way it is. You know, I, I think I... <laughs> yeah. and modest very modest as well <laughs> but sometimes you gotta say we, we spoke about it earlier when yeah, we were yeah. in the car uh, today is not about how good you are it's about how good you can sell yourself uh, and some people sometimes they're not that great but they sell themselves very well mm -mm -mm. so I think we came from a generation where you had to be humble about yourself but I think this time is gone now if you're too humble 
nobody cares about you. Yeah, in the UK, they have this thing like walk to walk, uh, talk to talk, and they just talk and don't really walk much. But those talkers very often end up actually making it. And those who are like kind of humble, you know, from Europe, especially or from Eastern Europe, we're just like, oh, I don't think I'm the best one. <laughs> but actually, you, yeah, you don't put, put yourself out there. So I've seen, I've seen it even in our industry. I saw some average fight coordinator and then all of a sudden they're like stunt coordinator in massive fight. Yeah, like, how yeah. did that happen? Because they saw themselves, yeah. you know. So, uh, yeah, I'm, I think I'm, I'm good at fighting. Uh, I've got a wide range of uh, martial art technique. I mm -hmm. competed in many different styles. Um, so I can act and fight, but I don't consider myself a stunt performer. I'm not going to jump off a building. Yeah, I'm yeah. not going to get hit by a car. So, um, and I've got respect for the people who's doing that. So I think that's the one of the reason why I call myself a performer mm -hmm. and not a stunt performer. Yeah, got it, got it. That's that that makes total sense. And like a lot of people still think like you know like Tom Cruise, Jackie Chan, like all these big names who consider me for years doing their own stunts. Yes and no. They come on the set, they're like, oh, maybe I'll do this one. Oh, maybe that looks fun. Like, and at the, the, the same time, there are producers involved, all the production is involved. You can't just go and risk that all of a sudden all the production is going to close down because you broke your foot or whatever. So with that, you have to be very careful. And, and it's interesting, like, why, you know, people who watch movies, like, do they really care that you do your own stunts? I more like care about like he does his own fights. Like there's choreography. There's like because there's acting beats involved. So that's very important. That's very important what you say uh, because I think you're a martial artist, so you see it that way. You see it the same way that I see. It. First of all, most actors don't do their own stunts. Mm. Uh, what they mean by that is they've done some fighting beats. And for me, doing fighting beats is not stunts. The stunt is when you're going to go back to your trailer and someone's going to be thrown over the bar, fall down the stairs, that's the stunt. Now, fighting beats for me are acting beat mm, because mm. emotionally, there's so much things that go through your Huge. mind before, during, and after a fight from the hype to the feet to everything. Then when you're doing the fighting, you're doing the acting. You, your character is growing mm -hmm. over the course of the fight. So right now, this is not stunts. You you doing the acting. And I think sometimes it's something missing when I see um, coordinator or people training the actor, make them understand that. You know, mm, I think mm, we mm. moved on now. They understand that they have to learn the choreography and they can do certain moves and stuff like that. This is great. But I think you have to reinforce the fact that, hey, this is acting. Mm, you have mm, to keep mm. acting the whole time. Yeah, it's huge. It's like 100% um, there's some stunt coordinators and directors that saying like, I need to feel that you try to kill that other person. I need to feel that in your eyes. I need to feel that in your movement and all that stuff. If you will f go for the full swing, you go for the full swing, not half-assed and stuff. It's very, very important. Yeah, no, that's, that's the reason. You see you see the actors sometimes in some movies now, and you can clearly see through the eyes, they try to remember the choreography. They're anticipating mm -hmm. the person mm -hmm. coming behind them. But I don't see the fear in your eyes. I don't see the aggressivity in those eyes. Yeah. And that's what, maybe we should cut down the choreography a little bit more. We should cut it a bit less. Less move. But at least I want to feel the intensity in those, or into those eyes. Mm. Uh, but that's that's missing out in a lot of the time. The time I, see, I, see, I see people say, oh, look, I've learned my move. Look, I see all those stunt guys doing roly police around me. I'm like, eh, I don't <laughs> care. And also for the stunt performers, there's more and more growing pressure in that we are not just stunt guys. We're stunt performers so very often like we when we do the fight yeah you did the moves perfectly you got this all done but i didn't i didn't see that again but sometimes your... sometimes i do see performer who do act very well who comes with strong aggressivity and and the beat is a round point but then a lot of time if the actor is not on point it make them looks even worse because oh, yeah. everybody around you is acting everybody around you is fighting is 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 in brings a lot of intensity and all I see in the middle is an actor who's just remembering his choreography yeah, yeah, yeah. and he clashes even more yeah that one is a tough one yeah that one's tough one a perfect example was as I mentioned you before I went to uh, Egypt uh, like almost a month ago now and those actors they had no fucking clue what they're doing and I was like they and they showed and they come in they have this like um, just being very arrogant. I can learn the move on the spot. No, you can't. You know, and all the stunties, Egyptian stunties are like, oh, yeah, yeah, he does whatever. Like, all the guys from UK, they were like, this is shit. Like, we got, you can't be serious to keep this. And then directors, oh, we, we changed it in the post. I'm like, what are you going to change in the post? The same with India. I, I noticed that with Indian movies, the same thing. They've got this, you know, arrogance of, yeah, I know you. Oh, that's fine. That's just, you know, yeah, that's yeah. Not, 
compared to Hong Kong, um, like I work with Donnie Yen, and some people might not like to hear that, but Donnie Yen don't do as much as you think he does. Mm, you know, he mm. does have doubles. But what Donnie Yen understand and those beats in between the fights, he got them on point, and he makes sure that he's yeah. got his close and up, that's the most and he's selling it, then he's got the intensity, uh, and then the rest is just, it's a double, they do face from placement, whatever. But, you know what? At least I'd rather that because now I'm really into the fight and that's why we still enjoy seeing Donny fighting in movies. Mm -mm -mm. Well, that's perfect that you're talking about that. How about we check out that video where you're fighting Donny Yen and um, it's in a gym, right? Yeah. You're smashing stuff. Yeah. Cheers. Third round. Hey, first round. I'm going to make you some money. So who are you supposed to be here? Uh, you're supposed to be I'm one supposed of the to be an MMA champion. That's that's funny because there's massive poster of me uh, around the gym there, and uh, obviously I'm supposed to be this MMA you know um, celebrity, and uh, so they put the name and they call me John Jones. Not only they call me John Jones, but they call me John Bones Jones. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's, it's, Why? Well, I don't know. They probably went on Google MMA fighter wanted to find a name. And then that's the first name that probably came up at the time, and they decided to give me that name. I'm like, you know, a bit like when European would look at something Chinese and they would write something completely wrong. Oh, it's as right. simple as this. You know, it's lost in translation. So I'm like, uh, no, you can't do that. That does not work. So I think uh, they called me David Jones, but they still kept the bone in it. <laughs> uh, and then um, funny thing about that, I think part of my contract was for me to have a name. I didn't want to be credited as fighter. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. And because I had a name, because of the poster, so David Jones. Um, but then at the end of it, they still change it and they put me as fighter. Even so, in my contract, we stipulated that I didn't want to be called fighter. Mm, 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 mm. So it's one of those things. And uh, yeah, Hong Kong style. When I finished the movie, I can't remember how many weeks I was there, maybe three weeks. Where was this? Uh, Hong Kong. Hong Kong, actually. Oh, nice. And then when we finished the movie, I said, okay, you got to get paid, go in this room. And it was like a gangster movie when someone came up with things. <laughs> open it up, a whole bunch of cash you give me there. You know, I'm like, what am I supposed to do with this money? And I need to change it back in the UK. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. And travel with it and everything. What's the guy's name in the middle? Uh, that's Brahim. That's my friend, Brahim Shab. Brahim, no, no, no. I, I met him. I just forgot the name. I, yeah. I worked, well, almost did the Bollywood film together, but mm -hmm. they... Uh, Vincent Wong, stunt coordinator, he was coordinating, uh, but we end up not doing it because uh, Bollywood messed it up. So now he's in Thailand, he just bought a house and he has a girlfriend there. So yeah, I mean, he came back in Europe for about two years and a lot of people said, oh yeah, because you can't find any work in Thailand. And then the reason being is in Thailand, they want as much work anymore and mm. the money was not very good. So he decided to come around Europe. Also, he wanted to spend some time with his family. And the whole time he was in Europe, he walked nonstop. Um, I think he went to Bali at one point, or no, to India. Yeah. And uh, he was a stunt coordinator in a film that's going to come out very soon called Monkey Man. Oh, okay. And then um, after that, he was in John Wick. He has a man fight with Donnie Yen. The fights got cut from the movie, unfortunately. No. Uh, that was before Donnie get introduced to the high table. No. Uh, and he's got a big fight between him and him. And Donnie ran in the street of Paris. And I think perhaps Donnie asked for him. And I think Shad was uh, familiar with who he was. Right, right, right. Um, right. And uh, unfortunately, that's been cut. And after that, he worked as a fight coordinator in a film in Budapest. And then um, he found his girlfriend and decided to move back to yeah. Thailand, brought a house. Uh, he's doing well for himself. And he did a movie in Hong Kong in between. Uh, I think uh, Donnie did a film called Rapid Fire or something mm. like that, maybe a year or two ago. And uh, he had a Chinese co-star with him, very charismatic guy. And um, uh, Donnie, um, um, Brahim did a, fi a film with him when he plays the main antagonist. So he's always been busy, very busy guy. I like the way you call it Brahim. I, I think it's Brahim. That's how I call him. Well, Brahim, <laughs> him. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to put an, an English name to it yeah, uh, yeah. so people remember his name. Okay, so this is where Donnie Yen comes in. And, and by the way, before we even start watching, it's like, how did you felt? Have you worked with him before? I never did. And the guy here on the right, the big guy, that's Mike Leader. Like, Mike Leader has been working uh, in Hong Kong for a very long time mm -hmm. in the film business. The first time I ever met Mike was for casting for Fearless, which was a movie for um, Jet Li. Mm, uh, mm. I did an audition for him. Was, they went all over the world to find, try to find different fighters. Initially, the movie was supposed to have 
12 different fighters from different speciality. Um, the script changed along the way. I think there's only about four or five now. And that's the first time I ever met him. And we kept in, in touch. And I lived in Hong Kong for a little while, for about a year. And he tried to put me on Hitman 1 and a mm -hmm. few other movies and didn't quite work out. And then the casting came up for that. He contacted me. He said, they're looking for an MMA fighter. Uh, I put you forward and then they pick me and they bring me over which is very rare when they do movie in Hong Kong they never don't often bring guys from overseas um, so big thanks for, for Mike and Mike's been helping a lot of people around the world to get into the movie business in Hong Kong nice nice but how was how did it felt to actually do this fight together with him it was great um, it's very confusing because initially uh, I arrived there on the Saturday I just landed a taxi picked me up. They took me straight to set. And obviously, it was like 12 hours economy class. So you kind of a bit smashed. Jeez. And straight away, went to rehearsal. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Not fucking around. Yeah. So um, it was great Japanese team. And uh, we were some of the moves, some of the fight. They wanted to see what I've got. They asked for the special move like they always do. Uh, we trained for like about four or five hours and they're like, okay, we kind of figure out your style. Uh, we already got a choreography. Let's start walk again. And then we were supposed to show on Monday and uh, we didn't show on Monday because Donnie at the time did a movie and the date of the release changed. So now he had to do the promo of this movie. Mm -hmm. So he wasn't around. So um, me, I was physically very prepared, but on Monday we couldn't shoot. And it took about two weeks before we start filming. So I was hanging around and then eventually I started working with him with his double. I'd say I think I probably fought his um, double for about 70% of the fight. And then he came in for his close-ups mm -hmm. and his special moves and stuff like that. So it's very tough. You know, Hong Kong, they're not messing about. You know, if you used to work with American or yeah, European, yeah, yeah. they kind of try to say, you know, if they're not happy, they're going to try to tell you in a way that you don't really get vexed too much. In Hong Kong, it's not like that. I mean, Donnie was after the, the, the DP, the director, talking to them like, I've never seen anybody talking like that on set. So I didn't expect anything different. And I think also he wanted to make a point, me being a real fighter, a martial artist. So for the first move I ever done, he wasn't going to be happy. And lucky for me, it was something very easy. Uh, something that we already shot with a double is me jumping on a bench. Very easy. So when I jump on a bench, straight away, he looks his shit. No, oh, that's not good. Not enough energy and stuff like that. But I think he wanted to put a step down. He wanted to kind of show me I'm the boss here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, you know, it went the way it went, but, you know, that's the way it is. That's the way, if you want to walk in Hong Kong, you've got to be able to deal with that. Yeah. You know? I worked only once in the Hong Kong production. They were here in the UK, and then, yeah, there's no kidding around, and they're so quick, and their uh, health and safety was unfortunately not there. It was just like, this, uh, there's a bit where um, I'm running towards this actress who was supposed to be push-kicking me with both feet, and she was wearing this high heels. And she would be like missing all over the place. One time the high heel just went like, just right by me. And I was like, whoa. Um, and there was guys, ah, are you okay? Good, good. Okay, let's do it. Oh. Yeah, yeah. I mean, they're not, the good thing that I like in Hong Kong, a lot of people think that Hong Kong stuntmen are crazy. And the reality is, let's take this example, this fight. Sometimes you do have um, stunt performer that would come up with ideas or stunt a fight coordinator. They would say, oh, how about we hit this guy against the shower or how about we just dropping on the stairs and because it's hong kong very quickly you got diy people in the back who would just bing bing bang 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 and within like an hour they would have the whole thing made of mousse mm -hmm. and you got a fake blasting things and it was actually quite safe i remember once in a one point someone's supposed to fold the stairs and i went and the stairs who look very real were made of mousse Mm. I've never done seen that in Europe. In Europe, you're going to say, no, 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 foot on the stairs, Hong Kong style. I'm like, what well, I walk in Hong Kong. They don't do it like that. You know? That's interesting. So like, they're not that's... as crazy as you think they are. But you got to be ready to do it over and over and over again until yeah. it's perfect. But then they know like those mad guys. I've seen less sometimes safety on American production than I've seen in Hong oh, Kong. That's interesting. That's interesting. Yeah, but maybe back in the days, like maybe there's some laws changed. People, too many people died. Could be the case. Same in India. A lot of people say, oh, in India, it's crazy. It's mad. I walked in India. Sometimes I walked on that set and the old floor, which looked like cankery, it was like a mousse about that thick. Oh, right. When, when you, you say mousse, mo what do you mean by that? Like, a, like a, a judo mat, foam, like foam. Like yeah, oh, you know? gotcha. Nice. And, uh, and it was painted exactly like the floor. And I was like, okay, I don't mind falling on that. That's pretty oh, good. That's awesome. Uh, I was fighting this guy. He had a, like a, a bouncing kind of, um, I don't know how you would call it, uh, like um, 
like a fake swimming pool and you just blow up you know mm -hmm. it was very bouncy so like that he could do a higher kick he could jump more higher oh, in nice. the air and stuff like that and then it was CGI afterwards there you go let's check out this fight are we are we in time there you go I'm guessing that's a Vaseline, right? Yeah. <laughs> now, let's just say that those punch are real punch. Mm. And there, that was his performer I knocked him out when I did that. So, the rigging was not very good. Uh, they messed up on the rigging. It went so you, on you, his back. you knocked out the uh, stunt, the stunt perform performer. Yeah, yeah, the uh, double. I didn't knock out him out. I mean, when he fought, he got knocked out. And I think because he's been walking nonstop for two Jeez. weeks, 14 hours a day, uh, no break, would get in the hotel, try to do like, you know, editing and, you know, all things. Those guys, they're just crazy. Jeez. I remember uh, the, the last few days of filming, we would shoot from 8 a.m. to 4.30 a.m. every day. So, and you know, the performer, they're not really looked after. They have to find their own way to the hotel and stuff. So I think he was kind of exhausted. Mm -mm. And they messed up on the ring and when he fought on his back, uh, he was out. Shit. So I kind of freaked out. I was like, wow. And then, uh, yeah, when Donny punches you, he punches you. You know, you've got to be ready to go. So why would he not pull his punches? Like, well, he can't figure out how to sell them without actually punching? I think it is punching? just the way he is, his style. And, you know, for me, him, he wants to be real. He's done it to other people. He's done it with Brahim on, on John Wick and stuff. Mm -hmm. like that. He's just going to come in, bam, 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 just catch you, you know? You know, that's what make Donny Donny and people still look up to him today. He does whatever works. Mm. You know, I, I don't understand if someone would punch you very hard in the face, but he looks like shit or he doesn't make any sense. I'd be like, what, why are we doing that? Yeah. yeah and yeah. it did happen in real movies sometimes. You know, you work with actors that they don't control, that they don't care, and they don't yeah. even apologize. But for him, he's a master of his craft. So you're like, okay, that's going to pay off at the end of the day. I'm taking a punch from these guys. Mm. Does that mean I'm fighting one of the best in the world and it's going to look cool? That's a huge, that's a totally a, agree with this point that stunt, stunt performers, you know, including me, we're happy to do some like harder hits or whatever, but when we know it's worth it. Yeah. One of the worst things is like, and that's actually I did with Scott, um, I think they called Avengement the movie. Yeah. I was doubling Ray Park okay. and they had to put the move where Ray Park is fighting Scott and then. Uh, Scott lifts uh, right That's Accident Man. Accident Man. Oh, that was one. Accident Man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So there. Oh, here you go. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Michael J. White was there as well yeah. in that fight. So there was uh, uh, Ray Park, Michael J. White. They're wearing like uh, judo geese and they're fighting uh, Scott. And then so uh, Scott didn't want to do it. So Scott had a double. So I'm on the top of the, uh, the Scott's double and he goes backwards. That's kind of a fall. I'm falling and then he's uh, flipping off of me. And oh my god, first couple of takes, I was like, my wind was out. I was <gasps> gasping for a year there. And long story short, they didn't use it. It never made a cut, and no one even had it on my on their phone. So I was like, I did like four takes, and even Michael J. White comes over and he's like, dude, that's a hard hit. And I was like, you know, trying to do my best kind of thing. Uh, or maybe I said something. Ah, oh, it's nothing. <laughs> But uh, it really hurts a performer, and I think it should hurt anyone that uh, your work is taken for granted and it's not really appreciated. Mm. You know, sometimes you got to take a hard hit, you know, and the hard hits you have to be put in the right place at the right time, so it's got a maximum effect. But yeah, sometimes you walk in those movies, and we're talking about action, but it's anything like that. Yeah, yeah. And we're going to get into it later on, but you asked me uh, three of my favorite movies, which was A Nightmare, obviously. It's very hard to say. Top 20. I, do, I, I picked those three specifically, and we're going to get back into it later on. Um, because they were three masters of the craft who know where to put a camera, how to use it mm. best, why they're using this lens and not that lens to, to create maximum effect. And now you walked in films when they got like 10 cameras shooting on the same time, we're going to shoot that scene from every fucking single angle possible. Mm -hmm. We're going to give that to an editor. He's going to do his job. I'm like, nothing's going to pop out. What are we doing this for? Nothing's going to pop out. Now you want to do a hard fold. Is he ever going to be in a movie? Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, it doesn't matter. You're getting paid for it. I'm like, yeah, not really. Yeah, that's what the director, uh, what's the name? A gladiator's director. Uh, Ridley Scott. Uh, Ridley Scott. That's what, that's, that's what he does. 
when we did um, um, Napoleon, uh, our, our coordinator was said like, guys, whatever you do, make sure you do it full on. Like he had about 10 cameras at the same time and from all sorts of angles. And then he likes to pick bits and pieces, which kind of, I think does make sense because you can find something cool in a sense, like, especially if you have so many performers. If it's a battlefield, yeah, yeah it does yeah. make sense. Yeah, yeah. If it's a battlefield, it does make sense. Yeah. And and yes, you, you got to take a hit for that. That's the way it is. And we mm. all done battlefield. One of my first job was a battlefield. It was on Thor, the Dark World, and it's about 200 people in this bitch. You know what I mean? Everybody fighting everywhere. Uh, but that's just different compared to like a very big hit when you're really going to get hurt. Mm -hmm. or, or, or big um, uh, dialogue scene or whatever. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. You want to get maximum impact from that. So you need to pick which camera, what's best to shoot it, how it's going to have the maximum. What is the point of doing five cameras? It's the four others. They don't look as good. Mm -hmm. What were we doing those four others? Do you know what I mean? It doesn't yeah, make yeah. no sense. So, and this is the move of the day. This shouldn't be at the end of the day after everybody's done this, that, oh, we, we need to rush now. We need to rush. We haven't got time. doesn't make any sense to me that sometimes some of the most dangerous things are done at the end of the day the when you've got day. no times. You know you know why? It's because the industry have no respect for stunts because they don't even know what a stunt is. They don't even know what a stuntman is. They keep hearing those actors saying, I do my own stunts. It can't be that hard. Mm, mm. If he does it or she does it, it can't mm. be that hard. Well, it's getting better now. It's getting much, much better than it used to be. A lot of, a lot of uh, uh, you know, actors, like, like for example, um, uh, Thor. Jeez. Yeah, um, uh, Chris Hemsworth. Yeah, uh, Chris Hemsworth and, and his double Bobby. Mm. Um, like, he's just like always praising him and showing him, that, which is great. And I think there's more and more uh, actors who are cool with that. And Jenna I Reeve as well on John Wick. He's yeah, praising and at the same time, it's like, why? You are there to act. You're there to act. Stunt performer is there to do stunts and make this the whole thing work. And I don't understand why some actors just like want to take that away or want to be that. You're not hired but for I that. But I said he's not even the actor; he's the decision maker. You know, after uh, the actor is what it is, they are eager to walk. They're gonna say everything and nothing to be able to walk. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm talking about all the executive, the producer, the director, all those people that should know better. Uh, and if they don't respect you, a lot of the time when there is accident and very bad accident, it's because they want to save money. Hmm. Say, so, oh, why do we have 10 people? Let's just, we don't want to pay for overtime. Let's just keep it five people. Well, the other five, they're here for safety because that's very dangerous. Yeah, yeah, what yeah, but they don't understand. You know, when we walked, I think, on Bond, uh, at one point, they decided that uh, a few of the actors that were playing a smaller role were going to fall down. Uh, I think they were Spectre um, agent or mm -hmm. whatever. Uh, and the stunt coordinator said, yeah, but they need to be trained. They need to have pads and stuff like that, especially that it's a cocktail evening so they're wearing small dresses yeah, yeah, yeah. and half of them were over 50 years old yeah I remember that scene I wasn't you know, it. it was yeah, like yeah. Uh, how can we make we need to train them what do you mean you need to train them yeah. well we need to train them and you need to have pads to fall, yeah. see the producer they don't even understand they don't yeah. understand that you can't ask a random person to fall 20 times especially one of them was about 80 something years old it's so funny I remember exactly that scene and I was there to make sure that when they fall, they land somehow on us. And That's, like, that was like, my joke yeah, too, yeah, which we is, you know, you're coming as a performer, <laughs> you do an audition, and they said to you, oh, you know, so uh, initially when they called me a month earlier, I was supposed to get beat up by Daniel Craig as a dancer. Then that, that went out of the window. They said, oh, we still bring you in. We don't know what we're going to do with you. And I was supposed to get show and do a stair I was like, okay, cool. That mm -hmm. should be fun. And then from there, it went down and down and down. <laughs> and eventually he said, oh, you see that 85 years old man there? <laughs> Go behind him and make sure you hold him when he's falling down. I'm like, oh, for fuck's sake. Was that your moment? You know, you, you, you like, dream of walking on a bond. <laughs> you, want, you know, it's a dream for, uh, for, for us to walk on a bond. And all you do, and, and eventually um, there was one an actor behind him who was a pretty solid guy. And I was like, you know, you, you can do that because the pretty solid guy kind of moves out of the way so I can hold on to him. I'm like, yeah, yeah. that doesn't make any sense in the scene. So you know what? I'm going to move slightly on the side. And there were, there, there were a big Chinese guy kind of the, on the heavy set. Yeah. I was like, okay, I'm going to help this guy. Um, and that's why I hand up and you kind of see me a fraction of a second. In fact, I lost my temper uh, with one of the extra on that day. Oh, shit. Because you're an extra guy and wherever the camera was pointing, the extra was like, 
they just pretending to listen. He had nothing in his head, you know, yeah, pretending yeah. to be an agent. Like, but every time the camera would turn, then he would come. I'm like, dude, you can't be everywhere at the same place. It doesn't make any sense. But you know how extra can be sometimes. Anyway, so we're doing this scene. I'm holding this big Chinese guy. He's, he's a big fella. And the guy doesn't understand, doesn't do something. So we let himself go. So he's pretty heavy, you know. And then the guy's behind him. And by accident, I must have stepped on his foot. Oh, right. So he came around and was like, hey, hey, uh, watch out where you're going. Uh, you know, I'm like, well, it's your job to be aware of me. Here mm -hmm. we're performing. I got to hold on to him. So it's not me to be aware. You're an extra. It doesn't matter where you are. Mm. And he started losing his shit with me. He was like, well, I was like, dude, just don't play that game with me. And you try to get the attention of the person that looks after the extra and handle the guy there. Do you know what I mean? Mm. So, yeah, I was, I was that close to whoop his ass. <laughs> <laughs> How was your uh, experience on uh, Bond? Yeah, I kicked someone's <laughs> ass and someone wasn't Daniel Gregg. <laughs> oh, man. No, it's interesting. Like, so for uh, people who, you know, you probably heard in the movies, like you have like people who stand in and do that. They, they, we call them extras or they're support, supporting act, um, artists. And uh, once in a while you meet some interesting characters there. Like oh, who's, yeah. the, who's doing that? And they're very proud that they're doing it and um, it's because uh, like for the, to qualify for BSR I need to do 60 days as an extra yeah. Jesus Christ I wanted to shoot myself so many times it was it was tedious just sitting around and uh, and so many extras are like oh I featured my hand was yeah. in the shot <laughs> I mean I worked as an extra I, I think we all start from there yeah, yeah, decide yeah. if you're posh people you go to posh school and posh drama school but for most of us regular Joes we start we work mm. as an extra so I work in an extra um, in the late nineties, uh, I did Tomorrow Never Die as an extra, and oh, I remember meeting Michelle Yeoh there. People didn't know who she was at the time. Yeah, she was just sitting there normally, and people thought she was an extra. I was like, Michelle Yeoh, <laughs> and I've got a picture with her, you know, so which is amazing. But anyway, so I worked as an extra before, and I remember at the time most extra were professional. They would come on mm. set. They would have a book in between takes. They would just read the book. They would have their own sandwich. Um, that was the job. They didn't try to be celebrities. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But now, you know, and it reminds me of that show that uh, Ricky Gervais did, um, Extra, which was Holy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. When uh, I'm not an extra, I'm an actor. You know, and <laughs> you see those ones all the time. Oh, I'm a, I'm a performer. You know, I can do stunts and stuff yeah. like that. And they all go <laughs> story. They all want to be in front of the camera. Yeah, I understand. I understand what you want to do. And and sometimes I see stunts doing that. You know, but you got to be aware that you know it's not just about you, right? Yeah, now, yeah. You know? And and sometimes I can understand them. And I'm like, cool. It happened to me before, and I'm trying to position extra so they get the moment mm -hmm. because I've been there, so I understand it. But it's not all about you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We had one time on a set, this lady, so there was an explosion. We were like just outside this restaurant. And um, so ex we said, like, okay, so extras would be further away and Stunty's closer to the building where explosion happens. So we take reactions. And this one girl, uh, I've done uh, gymnastics or whatever. She said, like, oh, yeah, I can do some, you know. And uh, stunt corner is like, fuck it. Yeah, on your own risk, just go and fall, like, whatever. And, uh, and she did like twice and then, and then she just disappeared. <laughs> Because, like, whatever she is, like, yeah, I think it was enough for her, just tw yeah. two falls. <laughs> That's why people realize, you know, they look at it, so I can do that. I'm like, yeah, but can I do it 20 times? Mm. Over. And, and can over. you do it properly? Can you do it like exactly yeah. how it's been asked? Because after the third time, I see you got a bit less energy there. Now you yeah. stop putting that hand on the floor. No, no, no. We need to do it the same way. <laughs> so, but as I said, on the same time, I've worked on film where I was working as an actor and on a main cast. And you know what, it happened more than once. I'm, I'm trying to put some of the extra forward. If he walks with the scene as well, sometimes I give them a line, I give them a reaction. I was in that thing, um, film called uh, One Shot. And at one point I walk in the corridor and I didn't have any dialogue for that. So I started rambling in French and being upset and everything. And I did it a couple of times. I felt like something was missing. And I see an extra that was there, were kind of dead. And I said, you know what, the next time I come in, kind of like, uh, do that, I'm going to shoot you in the head, like insane in French, shut the fuck up. And then you do a reaction. Was like, oh, okay, okay, okay. <laughs> and then we did it. I was just walking with like, oh, the, the mess of his shit. He like, Ugh. shoot him in the head, Poof. reaction. And uh, someone was filming behind the scene. I could see some of the director and producer, producer really reacting to that. It was oh, that was really cool and stuff. So if I can help people yeah, to have yeah. the little moment, but sometimes you got to realize, listen, this is not about you here. Yeah, We've yeah. got a job to do. It's about safety. You know, if mm. you're working in front of me when I'm supposed to perform, I might hurt myself, I might hurt you, my coordinator is not going to be happy, the director is not going to be happy. So, you know, we need to try to find a way. 
And one of the coolest things are also like when you can feel that they can respect and they can take your advices in as well. Because as a performer, you you know the best like what works for you. And some like director or stunt coordinator who says like, oh, Renars, how you feel there? Like, does that feel all right? Does it feel all right? And I would say, it would be more organic if I do push kick like this. And then they're like, oh yeah, makes sense. You know, instead of like, no, 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 we want you exactly like this. And that's my vision. But um, yeah, it's all about synergy and trying to put this together. Listen, let's have a little break. We've done like almost an hour now, and then we do a couple more sets. Okay. Here we are. We're back. We're back. Uh, we kind of do dove in straight away about movies and about where you're filming and what things you've done. Um, I want to talk a little bit more about you and where you're from and who you are. And I, yeah, a couple, uh, when I was reading up your IMDb and there was mentioned quite interesting, quite crazy fact that uh, by around age 14, you, you became homeless. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So can you tell me about... That well, what happened? My father was a very violent man. Mm. He was very violent. He was a bit dodgy. He was an alcoholic. And also, uh, his father was violent. So, you mm. know, it was a different time, man. It's the 70s. Um, not that it's an excuse or anything like that. But he was very violent. Violent. And what I mean by that, and, and you know, he split my cranium. I used to go to school with two black eyes. So, it's not the odd slap, you know. It was yeah. really beat up. And he used to beat up my mother as well. Now, my, my mother was violent with me also. Uh, that something kind of shut down in my head for mm. a long time because I didn't want to see it. But, you know, my, my mother broke a dish over my head. She broke the broomstick over my head. I mean, but it was not the same violence of my father. So, and because I didn't know any better, I thought that was the way for them to right. communicate with me through yeah. violence. So I kind of like shut down my mother's side. Uh, so, um, yeah, I remember the last fight they ever had. Every time my father would come home, I would just hide in my rooms and just try not to make any noise in the opening. It's not going to come in my room. And for whatever reason, beat me up. Was he drunk or was he He just... was drunk, but he was, I think, violent and frustrated. Um, I think they had me. My mother was 16. He was 17. And... I'm trying to figure this out in my head, you know, and I think because he was, they were very young, 16, 17, he's like, come on, I didn't kid. And because his father was violent, I think he wanted to find someone that loved him, mm. uh, with who he perhaps going to feel affection and love that he didn't get in his youth either. And then, pop, here I come. Mm. And now all the intention on me. So I think... Um, that's one reason why he had some sort of hanger to yeah, yeah. because he wasn't violent with my sister. Um, he had, I have two sisters which were younger than me and he never touched them. Mm. So I think that's one of the reasons on top of the alcohol and, and it was a very violent time and also the background I come from, you know, very poor working class. People didn't need any better in those yeah, times, yeah, you know. Yeah, yeah. Um, and he was violent with my mother too. You know, he beat her up as well. And I remember that last fight they ever had, blood everywhere. My mother, Jeez. you know, took a, a tap writer that was on the shelf, cracking over his head, split his head up and it's beating all over the place. And then we went away. We ran away. We didn't know where to sleep. Um, we tried to find people. We to is like us. your mom and Me and my two mom, sisters. my two sisters, yeah. Mm. And then we slept in the church for a while. Uh, and uh, the priest had a small room in the back and we stayed there for a little bit. And after we went to a special care center, uh, we would go and feed ourselves at the Red Cross with homeless people and stuff. And this was in France and Paris? or was No, it? outside of Paris in a small town called Bourges. Okay. Um, <clears throat> I moved a lot when I was younger. I'm, I'm born in a Paris suburb, a place called Avery, which is very rough. Um, it's a bit like Croydon, if you will. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, but Croydon back in the 70s, you know. Um, so, uh, and we moved a lot. So, um, yeah, and uh, from there, eventually, we found our own place, you know, a social you know, apartment in a very rough area. And I thought, okay, finally, I'm going to have a normal life, like mm -hmm. any normal kids. But my mother was still very young. Uh, and obviously now she was free. So she started going out a lot. She started clubbing. She started bringing mm. men in the house. And for wow. me, it was very hard because I'm still 14. Jeez. I was like, for the first time, and it seems irrelevant now as an adult looking at it. But I'm trying to talk about my vision from it when I was a kid, 14. 14, I'm thinking now I'm going to have a mother and a real, real childhood. And now I see my mother, and which I don't hate her for it, but, you know, you know having fun and mm. bringing men and... Hearing your mom fucking some other guys, you know, in the room, that, you know, you're like, fuck. Most I'm like, beautiful sound ever. I'm like, fuck, that's it now. It's time for Jeez. me to be an adult, you know. So and you were, how old you were then? Four, and I was just coming about just close to 15. 15, then. and then your mom was, what, what was her age? Well, she was 16 years older than me. She was yeah. like, you know, 30, 31. Jeez. 
Still young. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Like this is, but obviously, again, for those days, that's not that that wasn't considered to be young. But yeah. in I think in your mom's case, like already have three kids, but still like want to live your life. Yeah, and that's enjoy it. it yeah. You know, so I, I don't hate her for it. You know what I mean? But for me, you know, I'm trying to explain the where kind of sort. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. I was like, okay, now it's time for me to be an adult. You know, uh, which now explained a lot of my own personality. I think I shut down from that time emotion wise. Mm -hmm. I've never really had friends. Um, even today, I don't know how to behave with friends and family. Mm. And you know, I've got guys with who I get on very well with, and it looks like they could be my best friend, but I don't know how to communicate, when to text. Mm. I'm not. I don't really know how to do that, you know, and do small talks and things like that. So, which really helped me because that allowed me to be uh, very uh, focused, Focus, yeah. go around <laughs> the world, not being attached to anything. Uh, and and like you said, whatever I would get my head into, being very focused, but then mm. lacking of real life, friendship and emotion and mm. all those things, what makes life worth yeah. living, you know? Um, because sometimes you realize now I'm 50 and it's not just about the goal anymore. Yeah, that was great because that allowed me to achieve certain goals. But life is not just about your goal. You know, life mm. is about enjoying life before you know it. That shit is all. Yeah. Uh, it's about enjoying those moments of friendship with people. And and uh, I missed a lot of that. So, uh, <clears throat> so yeah, I fast forward a lot there. But, yeah. And then about that time, I found a job in a video store uh, and started discovering cinema. And oh. for me, that's something new. Now I'm traveling all over the world. I'm discovering many things through cinema. I never, you know, I hear a lot of people that, that fall in love with the cinema. It was through theater, you know, going to the to mm -hmm. movies. I didn't. I couldn't afford that when I was a kid. For me, it was through the video store. And because I work in a video store, I would just like get two, three, four tape and then go home and watch them all night. Shit, you like Quentin Tarantino, man. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> that was his, his thing as well. Wow. And um, then what was the age when you got into martial arts then? I started martial arts when I was eight. Uh, in France, when you're a kid, especially at that time, either you do judo or you play football. All right. I tried football. I was terrible. So they put me in judo. I was still terrible because I didn't know how to fight back. Mm. Um, my mom spoke to me later afterwards. She was saying, the teacher, I thought you were useless. Because you were getting beat up by your father, you didn't know how to fight back. So when you would do rendering and you would do sparring people, mm -hmm. you just let people throwing you down because you didn't want to fight back. Oh, wow. And then when I did karate, when I was 10, that's different because you're doing kata, you're not doing so much sparring. Yeah, yeah. Especially at that time, I was doing shotokan. Uh, which is very much about forms and kicks and stuff like that. So it was kind of a little bit better. But then uh, when I came out of my shell when I was 14, then I decided, okay, now I need to take my life into my own hands. That's when I started Thai boxing. Mm. And because I was living in a rough area, Thai boxing was very popular in very tough area in, in France. Uh, and I really put my heart and soul into that. And I was just training, training, training. And that's where my real martial arts journey started. Mm. Mm. Yeah, I was pointing earlier. That's uh, that's what I started with was Shotokan. That was my first martial art as well. I think it's quite a nice base for. But yeah, then um, Muay, Muay Thai. You said mm. yeah, yeah. That's such a totally different ball game. Completely, like especially back then. Thing. It was very traditional. Uh, mm. In fact, that's that, that's what got me into a clash with my teacher because my teacher came from Thailand. He was a French guy, but he really studied in, in Thailand. And people might not know, but in the late eighties, uh, early nineties, Thai boxing, kickboxing was very big in France and Holland. Mm. That's some of the biggest show in Europe. Yeah, in Holland. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, because there, there's so many fighters now. When I live in Bali, there's so many fighters, the kickboxers, like uh, Muay Thai guys, they come from Holland. Yeah. Yeah. So it was huge back then. And some of the biggest events were in France because of Canal Plus. Canal Plus was the first one that put uh, mm. Thai boxing on the map. A bit like MMA right now. So, um, and a lot of French guys started training in Thailand. In fact, you had multiple Lumpini champions that were French. Mm. You know? So Thai boxing was very big. Um, I start. I remember when I trained there. It was only guy from Laos, uh, guy from the French Foreign Legion, and like rough kid from the neighborhood. So it was like tough. And I remember this dojo was like ice cold in the winter. You had to jump the ropes with those big ropes, and you bah, catch your toes. <laughs> catch your like, toes. Oh. Yeah, that's the best. You know, and you would like put all this Thai oil, and you would do a hard sparring. I remember getting knocked out by this guy from French Foreign Legion, which was like. In his studies, you know, massive guy, like six foot one, Jeez. 205 pounds. I was like 14. So 
But then, because I started watching a lot of movies, um, I already wanted to train in different martial arts. I was mm. really inspired by Bruce Lee as well. So I wanted to master a different style. I wanted to test my skill into the ring as well. That's the reason why I started competition. I never wanted to become a champion, never did. I wanted just to test my skill initially, to test my skill as a martial artist. Um, and because I used to watch a lot of movies, I used to sometimes some time copy what I would see in movies. So I would do like mm. take window kick, like spinning hook kick, 360 and stuff like that. And my teacher was like, what is this shit? He said, if mm. you want to do this, go and do kickboxing. Because kickboxing was the enemy of Thai boxing. You know, kickboxing oh. was this fancy, fancy shit. So um, eventually, I find this kickboxing is this instructor called Simon Konku, who came from Zaire. Uh, he looked like Billy Blanks. <laughs> Big African dude, muscle everywhere, like amazing genetic. Came from uh, Kyokon Shikai Karate and uh, started doing uh, Japanese kickboxing, mm. which is like kickboxing, but without the knees. A bit like K1. Okay. Uh, and that was more my style. And no elbows as well. And but no it, elbows. Yeah. And the guy would come into the class, speak in English, one, two, one, two. He would put some music. You know, he would do any... I was like, shit, this is Hollywood. This is great. Yeah, yeah. So that's more my style. When you see me fighting, uh, I don't have this really typical Thai style or yeah, anything yeah. like that. I'm more like what you call Japanese kickboxing. Because kickboxing initially came from Japan. Then American did their own style of it. I used to be called Full Contact or, or Full Contact Karate. Mm. Uh, what B. Wallace did back in the days and uh, Joe Lewis. Uh, but Japan had their own style of kickboxing, which is, as I said, much more closer than what K1 is. So Japan is uh, creating so many martial arts. Like, how many other martial arts are coming from Japan originally? Well, you know, uh, so there's karate yeah, as well, and judo, jiu and jiu-jitsu, which is considered to be Japanese jiu-jitsu, and then it became... Uh, Brazilian jiu-jitsu uh, changed that. Well, not became, but it's a different style. And all the variation of karate. When people say karate, there's so different, yeah, many yeah, yeah. different style of karate as well. And even now, I mean, in recent years, you know, they got these different, this, this karate competition, which looks very much like MMA. They're wearing those head guards, yeah, which yeah, looks yeah. like bubble. I think this is great. If I could do that, I tried to find a school in the UK. There's only one guy teaching it. It doesn't look very good. But I wish I would get back into competition in that style because mm, 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 mm. I like that. And it's back to traditional. They're wearing the gi and everything. And, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so yeah, and, and different type of judo as well. People think judo is only one style. No, you already at the time had a judo that was more specialized on grand fighting. Mm -hmm. That always existed. It was not as much well known because um, the competition of judo, especially for the Olympics, was much more about throwing than the grappling. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But already back then you had a judo style which was a lot more about the grand game. Because, mm, yeah, when I did judo, um, we we did ground game, game, but it was very subtle, very small, very, just a couple, like a scarf grip, whatever, just very basics. Um, and then when I went started doing BJJ, I was just like, I can't do anything grappling. <laughs> I was like, what is going on here? Um, and then, so, I was wondering, when you saw those movies, the, the action movies, the fight movies, then, then you just kind of start generating this idea that that's who you want to be or that's what you want to do, or you were just fascinated and you maybe want to copy it, it just looks cool, or... Yeah, it was an inspiration in my martial art journey. And like I said, I wanted to test my skill as, and wanted to be the best martial art artist I could be. Mm -hmm. uh, and then I discovered Van Damme. Mm. And... <laughs> <laughs> and then for me it was a revelation sure of course you had the Stallone you had the Arnold Schwarzenegger in the 90s my favorite action hero was Western Snipe I think it was mm -hmm. so cool and a very versatile um, type of you know martial art he would use yeah. uh, but Van Damme was like a guy like me mm. he was Belgium he would speak French like me he's like 5 foot 9 he, he looks like a regular guy mm. and it's like if this guy can make it so can I yeah you know, it, it, this is why it's important. Today, we are talking about people being able to see themselves on screen and how important it is. And I think sometimes people can't articulate it well. You know, people people said, well, I was inspired by so many people and some of them weren't white, you know. Yeah, sure, me too. I like Jackie Chan. I like Bruce Lee. But they didn't hit me the same way that yeah. Van Damme. You know, Arnold Schwarzenegger looked like a freak. He was a freak. <laughs> Bruce Lee was a freak. Yeah. I, couldn't, I couldn't relate to those guys. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Van Damme looked like a regular guy. He was a geek who was bully, who speak French, who left, left some weight, went to Hollywood, was the next try, made in 
I can relate to that. I yeah, can understand. Yeah. So what I can understand that now some people want to be able to see people they can relate to. Sure, they can appreciate different actors and actresses from different backgrounds, but it's nice for people. And, and they might not get, want to get into um, acting, but at least they might be inspired by people that kind of look like them on screen mm, also. Mm, mm. So I think this is important, but the problem is Hollywood don't really know how to explain it well. Right. Um, but yeah, so Van Damme was like, okay, cool. That, that's uh, Maybe I can do a movie too. How old is he now? It's like Van Damme, 65? Like 60, yeah. Yeah, in his 60s. Yeah. yeah, it's like 15 years different. So when yeah. you saw him, then it's like not that far. Like he wasn't that much older than you. And Yeah, uh, yeah. yeah. And Bloodsport, I mean, Bloodsport was like, you know, at the time, oh, it was like, the shit, what's yeah. that all about? You know what I mean? We haven't seen a movie like that in years. Hmm. So, yeah, that, that kind of, and then now I wanted to become an actor, but how do you become an actor? That's not my world. I don't know. Hmm. I, I don't live in Hollywood. How does that work? But then I realized, and also I was very creative. I used to do a lot of drawing and stuff like that. I think that's something you can relate to. I, f yeah. I find you being very creative. And in fact, a lot of stunt guys are very creative. Mm. Uh, but sometimes it's great and when you can find a way to be creative. But sometimes you got this inside you, but you don't know how to, how to use it. Yeah. And then I was like, I can use martial arts to be creative. And I can use the ring as, my, you know, and my skill as a, Paintbrush. My canvas. Yeah. <laughs> Look at all that blood splattered on the floor. <laughs> Pretty much. I would do like spinning hook kick and I hear the audience like, yeah. I was like, I like that. <laughs> and drag the guy around. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, and that's what made me a very popular fighter because for me, um, getting the audience excited was more important than winning the fight. Mm. I wanted people to react to what I was so doing. So why didn't you do WWE wrestling then? Oh, <laughs> uh, that, that's not something I was into at the time. That's, that's a different, something. totally yeah. different ball game. Yeah. Uh, so, so for me, it was a way to express myself, you know. Mm. And and as I said, instead of doing it uh, on a on a set, I would do it in a cage or in a ring or anything like that. And people would like it because I would play a character, behind, you know, at a camera behind the camera and on a microphone, and I would be entertaining in the ring and stuff like that. So. I, I tried the whole thing. I, I remember fighting in kickboxing in America in 1993. Mm. And two weeks prior to that, they had the first UFC. And I was like, oh, okay, that's, that's interesting. I, first I like, UFC. You know, I'd like to do that. Then I went back to Europe and I met one guy when I was in America and he liked me and I won a tournament over there. He said, hey, if you come back in America, we're going to put an academy together. So I went to France, put a bit of money for one year and in 95, moved to the US in you know, hope to try to open the academy with him. Uh, obviously, it moved on to something else, and I did my first MMA fight over there, which at the time was not called MMA. They used to call it Valtudo, which was the Portuguese way to say. I heard of that. That's like there's a no rules, nothing, yeah. and they and they till they kind of almost pass out or whatever. Yeah, like, it's, it's, it's like uh, in America they used to call it Norse Bard. You know, it's the early day of MMA. Basically, yeah. you know, there's there's no rules, there's no gloves. Yeah, Joe uh, Rogan talks about it a lot. The, the Valetudo. That's, that's how it, he Valetudo, calls it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And but back then it was not like you didn't have those. Evan, they used to do it in Brazil, mm -hmm. but uh, in America it was brand new and people would do them in the dojo. You know, mm. hey, let's close the door. Let's fucking do it. I had uh, my previous. Uh, sorry to interrupt. My previous uh, guest. Um, uh, podcast he's a professional fighter in bali and we were talking about how the ufc just started and there was not really ufc and uh, how they could punch people in the groins mm -hmm. how they could do the, yeah. all sorts of weird shit and i found a video there's a video where the guys <laughs> punching this guy in the balls lucky they weren't very good because now with the level <clears throat> of athleticism strength and precision that people have if you could bring those rules oh back they god. would kill people oh my god they would kill people yeah you know it's, it's just not the same back then it was a bunch of fat guy that just mm -hmm. bought the, the black belt from jd sport and did those tournament in the black dragon tournament yeah, yeah, yeah. they were fucking making out Jeez. you know what i mean but <laughs> those guys still exist they're doing a comeback it's funny because for a long time you had all those wannabe martial artists that all those mickey mouse stories and when the ufc became very popular they all kind of disappear Mm. And now I think they're all doing a comeback, you know, with some sort of Krav Maga or self-defense mm. technique. And they all got those obscure, you know, moves and put your hands here, I'm going to remove it. They're doing kind of a strong comeback because a lot of people can't do MMA, even, even for leisure. You know, it's quite physical, it's quite hard. I see a lot of people getting injured, even when you don't go hard, doing mm. racing, getting thrown on the floor, uh, try to scramble off the floor, oh, twist my knees. It's not for everybody. So a lot of people think, oh, no, fuck that. Doing mm. a warm-up and press-up and sit-up and sweating and being out of breath. No, I'm going to do that thing where we just pretend to 
baby killers. Uh, and that's what's doing a comeback. <laughs> that's what we do for a living. <laughs> <laughs> I just do that thing when I'm a killer. <laughs> Yeah, I think one of the biggest ones probably now, like which is for leisure, for people just do it um, as a recreational. It's it's BJJ, I guess. So uh, it's not for everybody, it's, even BJJ. No, no, it's not. Know. But do you think it's the biggest one? Yeah, at the I mean uh, MMA just b made millionaire, but uh, no uh, MMA coach, BJJ guys. You know, BJJ yeah. says, oh yeah, do BJJ. It's like MMA, but you're not gonna hurt yourself. <laughs> you know what I mean? Uh, so which is fine you know and also you go gold you got a belt you got everything you got yeah. some sort of reward you got these little stars you got you know so I can understand why people get into it you know you make them like make them feel they do fighting but without doing fighting mm. um, which there's some truth to it but now nah, I mean uh, BJJ is so removed to modern MMA and uh, it's just it's a secondary style now you know what I mean you got to be aware of it but it's not as important as what you think you, if you know it doesn't move and how to counter them you're good to go you know yeah. so um um, but yeah, I understand why. But even BJJ, as I said, I see a lot of people getting injured. You're still physical. You're still sweating. You still have to do the warm-up. You have to do the shrimping. People are like, yeah, you know, I buy a T-shirt that says, crap, my guy, I train with these guys. Apparently, he kill, kill half a dozen people in, in Vietnam. You know, he's doing the gun. It's, it's like doing Steven Seagal movie. You know what I mean? It's like, oh, give me a gun. I remove it. I'm yeah, a yeah, badass. Yeah, yeah. Most people are doing it for fun. They don't. They don't yeah. believe that they can do it. There's a few people up there that take it a bit too seriously, and we come to you and say, "Yeah, in a straight man, it's not like in a cage." You know me. I'm like, shut <laughs> the fuck up. Man. It's like a, you know, I always say to people, it's like someone that learned to swim by the side of the pool on the iron uh, ironing board. You know, and he's doing that. Yeah, yeah, and he's yeah. trying to explain to me that, That's yeah, but me, I'm training to swim in the ocean. You, you're just doing your laps there. But me, I train. I'm like, what the fuck? You don't even oh, get God. wet. <laughs> you know? So, but as I said, it's armless at the end of the day, you know, but we saw a few people that take it a bit too seriously. But how are you going to convince these people? It doesn't matter. Yeah. Really. Yeah. It's because um, I, uh, one of the first jobs I did when I moved to UK, I was, I, I got this qualification. I don't know why I thought it was going to be cool. Exercise to music instructor, so I could teach aerobics. Yeah. <laughs> and there was this class I was teaching was called boxing aerobics. Yeah. And like these people come in, and I was like, because I used to dance and I used to like also teach karate, whatever. So I had a kind of idea. I, I would try to combine a dancing movement with like a little bit of fight, right? And these people come over, and they're like, oh my God, this is the best class ever, like the greatest. And three weeks later, they're not there anymore. Yeah. Like, they, their attention span is ridiculous now for anything. Like, oh, yeah, it's amazing today, tomorrow. Like, But to succeed in anything, you have to consistently do something, you know, consistently. And that's where what it differentiates us from the all the other people, you know, that we're so stubborn. We are focused, as you earlier said. Like, And I can totally relate. My, my childhood wasn't as crazy, uh, but it was qu like quite a lot of similarities. And um, and my reward was at home that I my dad would say, now you've done all the work, everything is done around the house, and now you can go play football. Mm -hmm. And nowadays, kids like try to convince your child, you're like, oh, no, please go to f play football. I was like, for me, that was a reward. A totally different time and different uh, experience. But yeah, it's certainly you saying that because I did, I, put, I teach book exercise as well, I did that. And in fact, at the time when I was getting my qualification to be a personal trainer in the late 90s, you had to have an NVQ level three. You have to have different components. You yeah, have to yeah. do aerobic on music or at least a, a kind of a group exercise. You have to be doing all those things. If no, you couldn't teach in the gym. Yeah. You couldn't get in the gym and say, oh, I'm a personal trainer. It's like, no, you have to work as a gym instructor. Yeah. You're going to clean up the, yeah. the, the machine. You're going to start doing free program for the members. And as a reward, if you're a good guy, we might let you personal train. Right. It was uh, it was not like now nah, anybody's a personal trainer, you know. Uh, but at the time when I was teaching uh, box exercise, that kind of got me in there. I went from being a kitchen porter on Piccadilly Street in a restaurant for three pound an hour, making twenty five pound a day, to two years later teaching boxing Arabic and making twenty five pound an hour. Mm. So I was like, mm -hmm. you know. And if we would have teach traditional martial arts, traditional boxing, they wouldn't have nobody in there. So what I would do is I would do box exercise, but little by little, I would start to introduce some real technique to it mm. and get people to face each other. I would use the music as a warm up and then I make them do a little circuit training so, you know, they can yeah, reinforce get themselves. More exciting, yeah. And then eventually, Next time, you know, they're all doing real boxing. I would bring some pads in and stuff like that. So you need to find a way. You trick them in. Yeah. <laughs> gotcha. Because back then, martial art, you didn't really have much. I'm talking 97, 98. You didn't really have martial art in gyms. 
Mm. I think one of the first one who kind of did that, I'm sure other people have done it before, but kind of popularized it, was the first gym box. Yeah, gym and box. That's, owner, that's where I used to work, yeah. The owner of gym box spotted me in that gym I was teaching at. Mm. He came to me, he said, we're opening a new gym called gym box and we want you to come and work for us. Oh, and I'm nice. like, sure, whenever it happens. Then I moved to Japan in 2003. Yeah, I lived in Japan for one year. And then eventually they opened the first gym box in Oldborn. And he emailed me. He was like, we're opening the gym. Are you still interested? I'm like, yeah, I'm in Japan right now, but I'm coming back. And I worked in the first gym box. I was one of the first employees nice. that they had hunt. I used to teach in Holborn as well. Yeah, hey, look at us going back, way back. Okay, so we got, uh, so that's about your upbringing, which was uh, pretty pretty interesting and how do you how can you say about as you said like there's a lot like things like i struggle also with certain things from my past and um but uh, it's been a while now since you kind of figure them out or like you're still trying to work them out like and then you see like oh i'm i'm doing things like this because of those things happened to me in the past this is how i react or it's like and sometimes i feel like i I think I would need to get like a shrink or some kind of a help or something. But then at the same time, ah, that's just a waste of time. I could just, you know, do a gym or something like that. It's like, I am, I would say like, I'm in kind of a denial that I have issues, but uh, especially when it comes to intimacy, growing up in a family where we never hugged each other, we never said that we love each other. Yeah. You know, that's, for me, it's it's a tough and like whoever I end up like dating or whatever, they like, they can sense it like, dude, you're affection. I'm affectionate in different ways. Like I'm joking around and this, but like I'm missing certain things. So how is that with you? I think it's like, you know, eventually people, when you train, they say, oh, you know, I'm going to the gym today. Oh, that's easy for you. You've been doing it all of your life, you know, for me. It's an, no, it's, it's hard for everybody. Yeah. Some days I don't want to go to the gym. You know, I get up in the morning, it's raining. You know, today I've got to go on set. I've got to go to the gym at four o'clock in the morning to make sure that I beat traffic. But so, so no, it's not easy. Yeah. It's, you have to work on yourself. And I think for me, is you got to work on yourself. My, my wife pushed me a lot to go and see people and stuff like that. You know, I didn't want to come here today. You know, I, I didn't want to come out. My wife said, fucking, you're going. You know, go tomorrow, get your train ticket. I'm booking your train ticket now. You need to come out of the house. You need to meet people. So, so wait, wait, wait. I have to thank your wife that yeah. you're here. <laughs> yes. What's, yeah. her, what's her name? Uh, Helen. Helen. Shout out, Helen. Thank you so much. So, <laughs> so yeah, you got to work on yourself. You don't try yeah. to come out. I'm contacting people. I'm, I'm trying to get out of the house. Um, because that's another thing because we moved a lot when I was a kid and also eventually uh, I owned my own place when I was 19 I moved the house it's funny because now I see people online on TikTok or on social media and they're 20, 21 and to me they sound like complete idiots and I was like <laughs> by your age I had my own fucking life you know what I mean it's like what's going on here but um, yeah uh, because I never really had my own place I, I, like I said I moved to America, then I came here and I moved from place to place because obviously it was expensive. I moved to Japan, I moved to Hong Kong. Then now I've got my own house and I've got my own comfort for the first time in my thing. I've got my own fucking place. Yeah. You know, it's a whole house, that's mine. I want to be in it. I want I want to be comfortable, you know, but that's that's the that's the thing. You know, you get too comfortable. My wife mm. said, no, you need to come out of the house. You need to meet people. You need to do things, mm. you know, so I need to force myself, you know what I mean? What does your wife do? What does she... Oh, she works in the city. She uh, sells on IT and stuff. I nothing to do artistically, mm. nothing to do with me. We're completely different. We are yin and yang, which is very strange because you see people like when they're looking on dating site, they try to look for someone that are like them. Mm. They like the same thing. But sometimes what you need is someone who's the complete opposite of you i can totally relate i need someone different i like because because the things i do whatever and some girls who are like kind, 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 i'm more attracted to like timid not that crazy and they look at me like you're not gonna have fun with me like you do all this stuff but like i'm not looking for someone who's doing all the same shit i want to meet the hang out with someone who is can tell me something totally different or like different things going on and i tell you from my side like um it's it's weird when yeah also you see in stunt industry they have these power couples who also both stunt performers yeah. and they get jobs for each other it's like oh my god you work together and you have to come home together that's just way too much well I maybe mean, it works for them as i said that's yeah. why that's why we were different that's why when we listen to advice or dating sometimes people don't know where to go or who to pick mm. or they don't really know what they like themselves my wife's completely different i mean we moved to this new neighborhood about four years ago and within like three months she knew every single neighbor she knew oh, everybody wow. I don't know any of those motherfuckers' <laughs> names. I don't know anybody. You know, uh, and and she goes out all the time. She goes so many friends, and she meets so many people. And me, I'm like, 
I don't want to come. Uh, you know, what's your weekend? What are you doing this weekend? Uh, staying home. I'm putting some movie on. <laughs> I'm making a cigar. That's it. You know, so we, we're completely different, but it works for some sort of way. It completely works. You know what I mean? Yeah. And, and there's a few things that you need to have in common, I think. One, sense of humor. Mm. Sense of humor is you can't. Hallelujah, brother. I can't, can't agree more. Two, fucking. <laughs> you know. Helena. <laughs> if, if, if one of you is more sexually active than another, and sometimes it's the woman who's more sexually active, and, and you're going to have ups and downs, and things going to change, and you need to reinvent yourself, it's gonna, it's, it's, it requires some loud work. But if there's no fucking in the house, uh, maybe mm. both of you don't like fucking, which is great. Mm. But those two things are very <laughs> important. As I said, sometimes there's little things. You know, I remember when I used to diet, when I used to have a fight, you know, um, my wife used to suffer from anorexia. So she had a lot of problems with foods and stuff like that. And obviously she's, I, re I remember, she always looked at, make sure that I've got more in my plate than she has. And it's, you know, you got to handle that. And, mm. and when I was dieting for fights, you know what I mean? I would lose up to 20 kilos. And that would be a, a struggle because she would look at how much I eat and she would try to eat less than me. I'm like, fuck, you're not really eating anything. Mm. So that's why eventually I would go away from fighting camp so we don't get into those arguments. So sometimes you're going to find where to make it work. But as I said, for me, two of the main things, you can adapt, you can understand people, but if you don't have the same sense of humor or if you don't have the same sexual appetite, uh, that's not going to work. Yeah, yeah, the libido. Li, li, what is it? Libido, yeah. libido. <laughs> I don't know. I say it, but no, no, no. You, you, you're right, and I, and I definitely agree about sense of humor. Like for me, it's I hopefully for most of the people, but for me, I can't. You can't get my joke, and then for me, the worst one, not the worst one, but annoying is like if I'm the one who cracks jokes all the time, and then I feel like I have to be doing it all the time. No, no, no. How about you return the favor and also crack some jokes? So we go both. It's fun for both. Yeah relationship stuff i'm the funny one it. in the house but my wife easily she's got a very toilet sense of humor so i don't have to make very much effort yeah. a, a fart a, a fart would do the trick <laughs> uh but even the films you don't really like the the same sort of films either you know oh I mean? my god i just saw this video you have to check it out when you're home basically there's a game called guess the fart yeah so you come in a room so let's say your missus sitting somewhere and like Guess the fart, and she goes and she tries to make the sound, but with her mouth, what is going to be the fart? So she would go, or go, or like, and so this guy comes in the room, he says, Guess the fart, and the girl does like, and he literally farts exactly like that. He's like, Oh my god, you guessed it. <laughs> that's that's a, some special skills right there. That's a new game. <laughs> so next time you go for auditions like oh just just like what is the thing you can do very well i'm very good in guessing the fart yeah <laughs> very special skill um and then uh with the training wise like so you're training every day um you you should train in the mornings yeah your morning person first thing in the morning bang. Yeah. yeah smash it straight away and then you alter like between doing like some weights, doing some pads, or you yeah. try to kind of keep this. No, cardio weights, cardio weights, cardio weights. Cardio weights, so one day cardio, one day weights. Mm -hmm. Very simple concept. And I do push, pull legs. Yeah. So and it's then... easier like that. I've been doing this since COVID because obviously with COVID, we were very limited. So mm. I started doing push, pull legs. I'm like, oh shit, this is working very well for me. Also, we walk sometimes when you're away, you don't know where your routine is. Or today I'm supposed to be chest, but now I'm going to miss out on that. And I'm all weak. I don't care. You know, mm. it's like, it can be whatever. You know what I mean? I, I've go on set. There's a few being I can do pull ups or whatever. Yeah, yeah. And then Improvise. I can do chest here, so I'm gonna make sure that that day I'm making an effort to go to the gym. So mm. I think it's much more adaptable when you do something like that. When you said also about training, and when you mentioned that someone would say like, "Oh, you've done it all your life, and that's easier for you," and you say, "No, it's it's still hard for me." For me, the biggest thing about it is I don't feel right if I haven't trained. Yeah, absolutely. I just feel sick. I feel like. Again, I'm not, not having brushed my teeth or I haven't taken a shower. I just feel like, ooh, like this morning before I setting up the the studio and everything, I went straight away to Lloyd's, went for a, like thirty minutes swim, uh, steam room, and cold bath, and I just get out of it. It's like I'm different human. I'm like I can live now, you know. And and some people who don't do that on an everyday basis, I think I feel like it's not wrong with me. It's wrong with you. Something like you don't do the the maintenance of your main apparatus, you know. 
It's crazy. Like Jackie Chan in his autobiography, he said like, if he doesn't train one day, he feels sick. Yeah. And I'm like, I can totally relate. No, to that. you have to kick start the machine. I'm going to on holiday next week, and I'm not lifting any weight when I go on vacation. I leave my body relaxed a bit, but I have to do cardio every day. And as the mm. first thing I do, I wake up in the morning. I need to do cardio. I need to warm up the machine. The machine yeah. needs to be oiled up. I need to sweat. I need to feel yeah. like I'm doing something. Um, so that's the healthy side of it, you know, if, if you will. The unhealthy side is when you feel guilty about yourself and you're mm. like, oh, you know, I'm going to put some weight and this and that. This is the, the, the flip side of it, which is not very healthy. But um, I, I worked with a guy one time and he was looking after the rugby team in Toulouse. And he says to me that uh, a lot of the athletes, the worst thing that can happen to them, uh, those rugby players, is when they retire. All the injury happen when they retire because they're losing all of their muscle mass mm. and that muscle mass, that's what kept the body in places. That's crazy, isn't and it? And as soon as they stop that and they start losing their muscle mass, they go to shit. And now I see more and more people pushing older people, 70s, 80s, to lift some weight. Because mm. if you do have those muscles, it keeps your body into, into shape, yeah, yeah, into, yeah. into position. So for me, that's part of that as well. My, my body not only needs it, but I think that if I would stop training, if it does happen sometime, when I don't train for a while, my back hurts more, my hamstring hurts, I don't feel like my body's in the right position. Mm -mm. Totally agree. Totally agree. Yeah. Um, again, for me, the, the best way to, to say it's like you have a factory, you have to clean it, you have to maintain it, you have to oil it and everything. And when I say clean it, the same thing goes with food. I'm not sure what is your diet and how you do it, but I've been, for the last probably like seven years, I've been intermittent fasting all the time. Like I don't eat certain period of time. And the theory behind this is like you allow your body just to cleanse, cleanse it and then get ready for the next meal or whatever. And the same thing with the training. Um, yeah, I think it happened for me organically because I go and train, especially when I'm not walking. I go and train in the morning, and I'm not gonna come back. I have a coffee before I train, mm. and that's it. And then I, that means I'm not gonna have my first meal before eleven o'clock. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So that's fine. Before I used to get up in the morning and used to eat, and after a while I'm like, what am I eating? I don't need it. You know, it's become a habit. It's crazy. Because he's a little kid, you told you need to have breakfast. Breakfast is the most important meal on the day. I'm like, fuck, it's not. <laughs> but it's my body does it just woke up. Why does he need food right now? It doesn't. It hasn't done anything. Yeah. You know, and obviously they've done more studies and it's like your body actually, whatever meal you had the day before, so that's still, you have that energy. You still have energy from that. And your flight and uh, what's the flight and that response, what is it called? Flight or run or flight response is much stronger when you are empty stomach. So it's like if we're in a wilderness and we get chased by the dogs, if you just ate your meal, most likely I'm going to outrun you, you know? Yeah, because... I mean, first of all, I train every day, and some people say, oh, well, that's overtraining, this and that. My body is used to it all of my life. No, everybody can do that. That's why you got it. We are all different. You have mm. to stop thinking that, oh, this is the way to do it. We are all different. The fact that I competed at the highest level means that physically I might not be the same as everybody else. Mm. I've got something that is not super and new. That's not what I'm trying to say, but I've got thing you know athletically speaking i can you know the, the story that you hear many times that oh yeah i could have played professional football but i hurt my knee and my hamstring this happened a lot there's a lot of guys that could have been very good at football it's just that the body can't keep up with the level mm -hmm. of training that is required to compare at that level it doesn't mean they weren't good enough and it's the same if you become a professional fighter whatever athlete you are you compete at the highest level that means that your body is not quite the same as everybody else mm. and that means that you the the way you need to recover and it's not the same as everybody else so it's not because me i train seven days a week that everybody can it doesn't mean also because i train seven days a week that i take steroid mm. you got to stop all of this oh yeah but is it no. Mm. no so me i need to train every day i train every day but sometimes depending on the time of the year or if i'm walking or not walking i'm readjusting things Right, right, right. Yeah, for everyone, it's like if everyone has to be a different formula. And that's with food, that's with everything, with training, with everything. Uh, all of us, we are individuals with different rhythms, with different preferences. And as soon as people they understand that, the better it is. But people are lazy. They don't want to discover those things. And what do you mention about like someone says like, oh, yeah, I've got this knee injury, whatever. But the question is like, what do you do about it? Mm -hmm. Oh, you just give up? Yeah, yeah that, that's the easiest way. No, no, no. You have to figure out how to recover it. Do you need to do surgery? What are the other ways to do it? What are the remedies? What What can you do about it? And people just give up. Like, oh, yeah, this just didn't work out because you didn't do anything about it. I mean, sometimes you got to appreciate it and know everybody hasn't, hasn't been given the same card. And been walking in a gym in many years, uh, you've seen different people. And I mm. see people that train extremely hard, that are dedicated, that are walking 
eating very well and they still don't have that great body. You know why? Because they don't have that genetic, they don't have those muscle initiations. That's a good it point. It doesn't mean they won't put some effort. And you know what? I'm applauding these people even more because even so they don't have the result they hope to have. They still fucking do it 180%. You have to stop thinking, oh, this person, oh, yeah, you look all right. You know, maybe if you saw your diet, you'd be a bit leaner. No, this this diet is on fucking point. It's just not the same as you. Mm. I know people that smoke weed all day and drink rums and they've got fucking shredded <laughs> things back and they never train in their life. This is not how life works. Yeah. You know what I mean? So sometimes I've got more respect to people that might not look the best but they're training a lot harder than people that look way better than them. Mm, mm, mm. Yeah. Yeah. And you see, the other thing, like what I wanted to mention, is about people don't, uh, haven't been uh, physically active since they're kids. Like, I've been physically active since I could fucking walk. Yeah. Like, I always done stuff. And I remember I was in a, a, for my school, I was playing football. I was like on the field every day. I remember I wasn't cut at all. I had like no abs, yeah. whatever, but I could run. My stamina was there and everything. And then afterwards, with the time, I figured out what training you need to do to get the certain body type and all those things. Uh, but what, Basically, what I'm trying to say, there's a lot of uh, uh, examples what I see that people who never train their lives, they all of a sudden just go full on, watch some, you know, videos of inspiration and blah, 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 blah. And then they're like, oh, why am I not getting the same results? Why am I like, I'm training more than you train, but I trained 35 years before that, <laughs> like every, you know, all the yeah. time. So it's again, it's, it could be very, very different reasons, and then you know who is ectomorph and men mesomorph and body types, and you when you eat ten eggs and I eat ten eggs could be totally different yeah. thing because but we're totally that's different. That's another bodies. problem we have is now we kind of when we talk about training, we're talking about aesthetic. We're not mm. talking about performance anymore. Oh, is that, is, you're I talking about training about is how you look. I've seen this new trend of people who say, "Well, if you train, you're fat phobic." Well, since when? I mean, you can't just train for your health. Mm. Initially, that's what training is about. Training exactly. is not just going to the gym and looking at your abs. Training can be a variety of different things. In fact, for the majority of people, lifting a bit of weight three times a week and forget cardio, walk your dog. Walk your dog every day. Mm. Twice a day, go for a big fuck off one. That would be more beneficial for you than going on a call you on just doing this on a free runner for 20 minutes. <laughs> what's, your, what's the name of your dog? I'm going to put him in the, in the here. Oh, Dolly. That's Dolly. Dog. Yeah, Dolly. Oh, very cute. Um, yeah, I had her for five years now. She's a rescue. I had a staffie before for 17 years, and that, that's a rescue. I had a rescue this time. Every around. time I see your post, you and Cigar and your dog and your hat, and it just like, looks fucking sick. <laughs> it's like walking out of like a film set right there. But yeah, <laughs> to get back into what I was saying, we have to stop um, putting um, training and aesthetic at the same level. Mm. That's why when I used to have clients, I work as a PT, I used to say, listen, let's don't worry about that. Worry about performance. Right now, we, if the performance you're eating well, uh, uh, if we just focus on the performance, the body will follow. Yeah, I've, you just took my words out. Exactly. That's how I look at it. I mean, like, obviously, being in the stunt industry, and uh, for us, it's all about how high can you jump, how, how, how easily you can do this move, whatever. I don't give a fuck that you have a six-pack. No one gives a fuck. Most of the time, it's under the costume anyways. Yeah. And uh, yeah, but at the same time, I used to be a performer who used to dance topless. So yeah. that was very important. And I was surrounded by guys who would take steroids and whatever. And then, yeah, you kind of look good. But can you do a backflip? Can you do anything? No, you yeah. can't. So then just walk away. And some people can do it all. I look at someone like Errol. Oh, yes. Oof. He's going to be actually, he's coming next week. Uh, he's know. supposed to be not last week. He was very busy. Yeah. This motherfucker. <laughs> I, mean, I walk with him on back in action at the beginning of the year and he would eat muffin after muffin <laughs> after muffin. But it has to be he's, vegan, though. Uh, yeah, yeah. Vegan, vegan muffins. But he would get pissed off when he used to get some vegan food or vegan cake because he was like, oh, that's for us. You know? and, <laughs> but listen, I'm very excited to get him on because I really want to talk about all this ve vegan stuff. But the thing is, uh, I don't want to take his walk away from him because that's another thing. He's got great genetic. You can't, you can't just mm. look like that. But a lot of people would just stop that. Oh yeah, but he's got genetic. No, these motherfuckers trains, trains every day. Trains all the time. Yeah. I've been with him on set, walk all day. As I look at the Instagram, is that gymnastic? Yeah. Or he's lifting weight or something yeah. like that. So yes, he does have a great genetic. Uh, he's very gifted, but he trains also a lot. Right. On this uh, lovely compliments uh, about Errol, uh, we're going to finish our second half and then just one more left. <laughs> okay, Delki, we are back. Uh, we are back. And uh, this last segment, um, before we talk about books and movies and um, other, other stuff, I just kind of wanted to touch upon a little bit of your fighting career. So what? how long was your professional fighting career? And then um, 
So the first, uh, I don't even know, like when you do the amateur fights, when do you become professional fighter? So how long were you amateur before you turned professional? And uh, yeah. I mean, until... in France, uh, Thai boxing, kickboxing, you got to fight different class. So it's called, they go class C, B, and A. Okay. A is professional, B is semi-professional, and C is amateur. Gotcha. Because combat sport in France are very structured. Even so, now MMA started. MMA has been in the UK for decades now. Mm. Uh, but now that it started, it's only been allowed in France for about two years now. But they needed to have a federation. So now we're recognized by the Boxing Federation. So now in France, you got amateur competition, mm. semi-professional competition. You need to have so many fights besides being pro. Right, so right, everything right, right. is proper. It's not like here back in the days. I remember in the early days of MMA, uh, you used to show up and your yes. opponent wasn't here and they picked someone from the crowd. <laughs> someone who was, in parking lots. Yeah, <laughs> who was fighting as well. It was like 100 kilo. Like, what the fuck? You know Jeez. what I mean? Some of the first MMA competition here, I remember it was either you above 85 kilo or under 85 kilos. That's it. You're two weight class. Oh my God. I remember yeah, yeah, fighting Bayern Alcohol here. I mean, I remember I mean, you know, so now in France, it's very structured. But I fought all over the world in different styles. I fought in Thai boxing, kickboxing, full contact karate. I fought in shoot boxing in Japan. I fought in different type of MMA with gloves, without gloves, 10 minute rounds, five minute rounds. Uh, I fought in Sambo. I competed in wrestling in Iran. Uh, so I competed in different. I fought for 24 years and I think professionally about. I don't know, 18 to 20 years, mm. depending on what style of fighting and whatever. Sometimes you didn't even know if you were fighting pro or not. I remember back in the days in MMA, our pro fight, we used to get paid 50 quid. You know, so it's not pro. <laughs> I don't know. Sometimes you only add money if you win a tournament. Right. So is that pro? I don't know. So Yeah, um, it's interesting. When someone says like, you are professional this or professional that, so as in my head, it means that that's the money you live off. This yeah. is the money you make. You're professional. Like I'm professional stuntman because that's the, my main income. I don't maybe have some other little ones, but that's the main income. I'm professional. But again, like in the, in fighting, so you need to qualify to become a pro. So when you're pro, then you get paid. But, but that doesn't even mean anything. When I fought for exactly. the UFC, I used to get paid uh, $3,000 to fight plus $3,000 if you win. So that's $6,000 if you win the fight, right? Then they're gonna take taxes on that, and then you gotta pay, you know, taxes in the UK. So you fight three times a year in the UFC, biggest organization in the world. I fought in mm. the O2 Arena, twenty thousand people. Mm. I fought in the MEN Arena, fourteen thousand people, packed out, live pay per view around the world. Yeah. But you're making like no money. Peanuts, yeah. So basically, pro is, I think it's mainly just a different, different, it's the cate rules. different category. It's so the rules. That's what it three is. Three different things. It's the so. rules and it's supposedly you leave all. But I know a guy that fight pro and they're on a seventh fight and they're going to fight a guy who's 0 and 5. O -N Zero win, five losses. <laughs> oh, shit. <laughs> you ever see that over and over again? So what does that even mean? <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Is <laughs> You know, pro doesn't mean nothing. So what's the when, biggest uh, biggest cash prize have you won? Uh, towards the end of the UFC, I was making a bit more money, but I was making mainly my money from sponsors. Oh, okay. You know, and, and that's the huge difference between Europe and, and America, especially France, because France is very, very cheap. Even in movie business, they're so fucking cheap, man. Yeah. They don't want to pay for anything. They don't want to pay for transport. I know people who, who's actors in Paris, and when they have to shoot in the south of France, they don't even want to pay the train ticket. It's terrible. So anyway, the fighting game is even worse. So, uh, uh, yeah, towards the end, I was making more money with a sponsor. And mm. the way it would work, now obviously they've got Venom and before they had Reebok. But back in my time, you could have any sponsor. Mm -hmm. you know, uh, Some kind of a meat sausage factory. Some people <laughs> on, had on sponsorship. It was to wipe their ass. <laughs> Men's wipe, I think it was called. <laughs> Condom Depot. <laughs> 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 And the next sponsor is Condom Depot. I love it. <laughs> but any, 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 you know, any, anything to pay. So, and people would come in your gym and they try to, you know, decide you, oh, well, I won't want a patch for a patch. It was like $500. Mm. Uh, for a t-shirt, it was like maybe three to 5000 uh, 4000 for a short, 3000 for a cap. And try to get as many patches as you can. Right, and right, then right. you can try to make some money in between and stuff like that. But, so like proper hustling. Yeah, you got to hustle. <laughs> you know what? It's funny because I was talking to a friend of mine recently about it. Some people, you know what? They, they don't even find UFC because outside UFC, they make more money. Mm. I know shows like in, in East Europe, like there's a show called KSW. 
And some of the fighters in there, one of them who was their champion, like a middleweight, very, very good guy. The UFC offered him money. The guy was making half a million fighting in a show in Poland. Wow. He was like, when am I going to fight in the UFC for like $20,000? It's like, Shit. fuck that. Because he was a local celebrity. Sometimes you got to know your market. Yeah, yeah. And sometimes being a huge deal in your own small little market, you can make more money than try to hit a mainstream market. Look at Hollywood right now. They all try to make a billion dollar movie and barely of them make them. We should go back into doing 40, 50 million dollar mm -hmm. movie and make three, four hundred, you know, million, you know, uh, you know, money on it. Yeah, yeah. Let's let's stop trying to make those one point five two billion. This is it's not you know. So sometimes you got to know your market. And yeah, I mean, yeah, I, I think I made like 30, 40, 50 towards the end. But it was with hustling and you know things like that. After on between you try. So wait, 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 30, 40, 50 grand yeah. per yeah, fight. Yeah, but with sponsorship and noise and stuff like that. But, but then you, there how, was there was towards towards the end of. The yeah, UFC. yeah, but how. How uh, big of a um, uh, gap would be between fights? Like how many fights a year well, would you, you can do? Well, you can fight two, three times a year, but it's just depending. Now people fight even more often. Yeah. You know? That's why you see people like Donald Cerrone or whatever. They fought way past the prime, but they would fight like three, four, five times a year. They would make $250,000. Mm. They would make multiple million a year. And then they're like, okay, that's going to be my retirement. You know, the guy's got a ranch, he's got horses, he's got motors you can think of. He's got every bikes and quads and everything. Craziest injury, yeah. Nothing. Fighting, fighting wise, fighting wise, nothing. I broke my nose multiple times. I broke my hands. No, that's not broken. Look at this, it's so beautiful. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I broke my hands, but um, nothing, nothing major. Uh, is when I retired. That's when I, I did more stuff. I already had some back problems since I was a very little kid, and then I got it checked one time, and my hips is not in the right position, which doesn't help. I got three bulging Same discs, thing. and um, my L five is is just the worst. But also because my hips is not in the right place. Right. Right, right, right. Um, so um, my back got very bad towards the end of my career. Um, I, I pulled my hamstring very badly, but I did that on a stunt job. Uh, eventually, with time, my left knee started playing around, but nothing major, really. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I like it kind of like 50 things. Like, yeah, but the, other than that, I'm still here. <laughs> okay, let's uh, check out this fight. So before I show it, so tell me about it. What is the... Um, story behind this fight well this fight was funny because like i said it took me a lot of time to mature as a fighter because i did it for different reasons like i mentioned earlier initially to test my skill then after to do my own little show to have fun and then eventually i took it a little bit more seriously i was like oh then i'm winning one i'm losing one maybe i should stop mm -hmm. or take it seriously and i took it more seriously picked up my training beat up some good guys then hand up in the ufc and it changed the course of my career now i become more of a complete serious fighter uh, and then uh, I lost a couple of dodgy fights in the UFC, a couple of dodgy decisions. So uh, one, many dodgy. Uh, and then I was cut from the UFC. So I was like, okay, it's time for me to, to get some more wins to eventually go back to the UFC. And usually what people do is they start taking a couple of easy fights you know, mm. to kind of get their way in, to get the attention of the UFC. Say, hey, I'm, I'm still active. Me, I didn't want that. I wanted a tough guy straight away. Mm -hmm. As soon as I come out of the UFC, there were one guy called Peter Irving. And it was a guy from up north and um, tough guy, black belt in jiu-jitsu, uh, multiple Thai boxing fights, very good wrestler, very physical. And just before that, he beat a guy called Mad Dog from Sweden, who eventually ended up signing with the UFC, but he beat him. So he was like that close to being in the UFC. I mean, realistically, if he would be now, he'll be in the UFC already. Mm -hmm. But back then, they didn't have as many shows as they have now. So they were kind of saying to him, keep active, you know, keep being active and we will sign you up. And it was good. I wanted that guy. I wanted <laughs> that guy. Like everybody said, no, Jay's going to beat up. Jay's going to get beat up. This guy's going to be now. That, that fight is going to get me into UFC. But I had some other plans. And I was at that point so physically, technically, and mentally ready. And I'm like, you could put anybody in front of me. That's not going to work out. And I don't want to spoil the movie, but it didn't really work out for him. Oh, shit. What is this now? Is this the, just the beginning or that's the end yeah. of the previous no, no, fight? Yeah, no, that's the beginning. Uh, yeah, just the beginning. Oh, shit, that. The Legion, World so the, the World best World thing about this fight is the commentary because you can clearly hear that the commentary there for him. Even when I'm punching him in the face and kicking him, <laughs> they still try to say how good he is. Even when he's not doing nothing, it was like, oh, he's doing nothing. He's, he's great. Even when he missed with the kick, he's like, oh, yeah, great kick from Pete. But I'm like, ba 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 ba. And they're like, they're like two idiots behind the microphone. They don't know what to say anymore. They're like, oh, shit. Where was this fight? This was in UK. This was in a wonderful place called Hull. 
Okay. Have you ever heard of it? Hull. Hull. It's a place in the UK. I mean, people who's been there, they probably get the joke. Man, it's fucking terrible. <laughs> it's awful. And obviously, I had all the crowd behind him. I think he's from originally Newcastle. Lovely guy. After that fight, he became my best training partner. Oh, nice. We just trained together. And all the other fights, I think I had five more fights after that, and all wins, and he was my training partner. Who is who? Like, I'm trying to figure out. I'm the one um, uh, getting the takedown now. Okay, so you push him against that. Yeah, yeah. Well, obviously, he, at the time, he had more tattoos than me. Bosh. So good, hard to take down, very strong, very physical. That, and this you know, is how many years ago now? Oh, I can't remember, man. It's just um, maybe 10 years ago now. I say sometime, uh, took his back, managed to defend quite nice. well. Nice. Good, good skill fighter and does the trick very well, use the wall very well. Very nice. Very nice. Nice knee to the very athletically uh, gifted. You can see he looks strong. You guys like very similar height, very well, obviously you're the same weight category. Yeah. We see he's a lot more leaner. I mean the, the, the quality mm. there is not very good, but he's way leaner than me, he's way more um genetically gifted athletically speaking yeah so there i'm trying to go for a takedown i'm going to do a move there that nobody saw at the time that nobody really knew about so i can't really get my takedown so i'm going to get different move here grab his elbow up, go from the back nice see i do that which is a very rare move to pull off and you're like oh okay that's interesting what was the name of this one the name of the, the, the this it's, move they call it a sacrifice throw I'm not quite sure how it's called. Oh, I saw some wrestler. At the time, I was training a lot in America with very good wrestlers. I saw mm. them doing that. I was like, oh, that's really cool because I noticed that when he was fighting, he would always go for Kimura. So I was like, that would be the perfect move. So I kind of put that arm here and I hope mm. he would go for the Kimura. And as soon as he went for it, I was like, oh, thank you very much. I'm going to try that brand new move that I've learned. Nice. And bang. He's got to breathe. Take his time here. Look where he's at. So now I'm on my back. Yeah. The quality is so right bad, here. I can't figure out like I'm who's who. Back, yeah, but he's yeah. with the blonde hair. Yeah. Like, okay, so that's a big. Sam, I've always been very good on my back. Not anymore now because of all my back problems. So yeah. very good. I've mean, always been dangerous on my back. So try to go for a triangle. Try to switch to my plata. He's defending very well. So you hear about he's a black belt in jiu-jitsu, so he knows how to defend well. So you hear about forty years old, like third, like late thirties. Yeah, yeah, late thirties. That's the reason why I went 6-0. I beat up every single opponent they put in front of me. But by that time, the UFC was like, no, we're not interested. You know, I, They didn't say it, but I knew that they were just looking to to, to sign much younger fighters. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know? yeah and now it's even more obvious now all the fighters they signed, they're very, very young. Very Anybody young. close to 30, they're not interested anymore. Yeah. But it's a good, good kickboxer. Oh, Ooh, knee. flying kick, flying knee. They didn't recover from that one. I Did you land it? I landed it. Yeah, I Shit. could tell, look, see that he's backwards. Shit. He's not quite his thing anymore. He doesn't really know how to put his hands. I can feel that he's, he's not here. That's why I'm just relaxed. A bit too relaxed, but I'm too, too much in his range. You know, you don't want to be over there aggressive. I knew that he was dazzled, but you don't want to be too aggressive because yeah. he can catch you with something. Oh, yeah. But I caught him well with the right hand there. Oh, she's in trouble. They do give you some compliments, though. Yeah, well, at that point, I think they have no choice. <laughs> oh, that right. Oh, catch him again. Yeah, with the right hook, for that single. Just I see the shoes are. And that's it. Nice. See, <laughs> uh, fight is over. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no one got excited for you. So, yeah, that might not be my best fight. I mean, it's not as pretty and, and technical than no, no, my, my first and second fight in UFC. Uh, but for me, it meant something because, once again, um, not going the easy way. Taking the toughest guy around, one who was just gonna sign with the UFC, proving that I am who I am. I'm not gonna yeah. go for the easy way out, and uh, and dominating him in every range, and just saying, you know, I'm I'm still not done yet. So um, that's why I'm kind of happy with this fight.
even so, as I said, um, technically speaking, I've done way better than that. Mm. No, it looks good. It looks very good. I like the range that you go from also, you go from striking, then you also go for taking down and like you use that really cool move. Which, as someone like in movies, like, oh, that's cool. <laughs> that's what it is. You see, because I've done different martial arts and I've got a variety of different skills, sometimes, you know, um, I'd like to walk more and close with, you know, fight coordinator and walk on IDs because I sometimes I can clearly see they, yeah, yeah. they're limited. You know what mm, I mean? And mm, as I said, some people, they're there because they knew how to sell themselves. They climbed the ladder very well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, But maybe we can exchange some ideas. And some of them, they're more than happy. You know me, if you don't ask me, I'm staying in my place. You know yeah. what I mean? Uh, I remember walking in uh, Fast and Furious 9 and eventually uh, Justin, the fight coordinator, came to me and said, oh, you fought in UFC. That was like two months of me walking on with him <laughs> every day. I was like, oh, I didn't know. I was like, I'm not the one to talk about yeah, it. You yeah, know what yeah, I mean? Yeah. I'm, I'm kind of staying discreet. I stay in my place. Yeah. Uh, but if people want me to help them, I've got a variety of range of different skill of different style. How some you... people sometimes feel intimidated. I, I worked on another film, which I'm not going to say the name of, but... They would only do jiu-jitsu and grappling when I wasn't around. So they would send me, clean some maps and do some boxes. And during that time, they would do jiu-jitsu. But when I would come back, they would stop doing jiu-jitsu, mm. which is kind of weird. <laughs> you know? But how would you go around with that? Like, how would you introduce that? Oh, by the way, actually, um, I have experience in these martial arts and uh, choreography. Like, if you want my help, like, I'm here. And I think um, that would be the worst way to, to introduce yourself. But, but how would they find out about it then? If they do, they do. If they don't, Just they don't. eventually, think, you kind of... I think eventually, say. I think my name, I'm I'm not saying I know within the Orstan community, very far from it, but my name's been around. Mm -hmm. My name's been mentioned for good or bad reason, whatever that might be. But I think people are very aware of it. So either people are very comfortable with themselves and very secure and are more than happy to have me around and say, listen, that's your thing. That might not be my, how about we walk together? You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Or uh, at the opposite way, uh, they might just like, oh, no, I don't want that guy because I'm not very good. They might just say something, which I want. It's not because you're doing something wrong. but say, hey, that is wrong. Mm. Listen, I know my place, you know. But some people, they rather not have you around. So like that, they feel more comfortable. Uh, and everything in between. You know, yeah, be yeah, more or yeah, less. Yeah. So, you know, you got to roll with the punches. You know yeah. what I mean? You got to go with it. You know what I mean? So, uh, I don't want to be harsh, but I see some of them, yeah, they're just not very good. They know what the fuck they're doing. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? It's clearly. And there's a lot I'm of stay at my place. You know, sometimes of... people would fight you about it. I remember when I did uh, the Batman. The Batman, Ricky, Ricky knows about martial art. Ricky is obviously being a bad guy, but he's, he's a good martial artist as well. And Ricky knows martial artists recognize other martial artists. Mm. And Ricky was. In a fight, and he was playing the Batman. He was like, let's put Jess in that spot because the coordinator wanted me to fall down or whatever. I said, no, no, no. Jess should be doing the fighting. And when we started doing the fighting, eventually the move we had to do on the day were completely different than what mm. we did rehearsal 10 minutes earlier. Now we want two extra elbow. We want this, we want that. And straight away, bang, I add up straight away. And, and Ricky, I think, was happy to have me there because straight away my reaction was good. Yeah, yeah, I anticipated yeah. well and stuff like that. And it worked very good, you know. But sometimes you walk with other people, they didn't know you. They don't know you. They might not be comfortable with you. Um, yeah. You know, they'd rather walk with someone they're more comfortable with, which sometimes I understand. Sometimes it's a good thing. Sometimes it's a bad thing. So as I said, you got to be able to roll with the punches. Yeah, just as mentioning Ricky, it's uh, Rick English. He was a uh, main stunt double for the uh, the main actor. What was his name? The previous, uh, the last Batman. Batman. Yeah, uh, I can't remember his name. Uh, yeah, yeah, the, yeah, the guy from the... Uh, Vampire movie. Yeah. <laughs> That's yeah. how everyone yeah. knows. Twilight, them. Twilight. Twi yeah, from Twilight. Twilight and Harry Potter is, is one one or two Harry Potter as well. Is it? Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. I've been starting to watch Harry Potter because I ne could never really get into it's them. It's on Netflix now. It's on that's Netflix, so <laughs> I've been watching all of them since then when I was Me like, too. oh, that's actually fun. Me too. It's just so funny to see how this cast is growing up yeah. on, the, on the movies. It's crazy. But already it's, from film two, I'm like, dude, this looks like a, a grown man. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Or Hermione, she's just getting hotter and hotter. Hey. Yeah, um, interesting stuff. But yeah, as I said, you can't, sometimes you got to adapt. I, I did a, a job in the beginning of the year and and sometimes people, you know, sometimes they got a bit weird attitude. We are fighting outside. He sweat on the floor and um, I'm wearing a gray T-shirt, you know. So I had to remove the T-shirt because my jacket gone fire. So I removed the jacket and I've got a gray T-shirt. Now, I know they only got two change. So, and I know the floor is wet. So if you kick me or if I fall on the floor, I only got one chance. Now, if we need to start again, I only yeah. got one chance. So when we do the rehearsal, I said to the performer, I said, hey, try not to kick me. What the performer does, they kick me. I was like, what the fuck? You know, and they go in the changing room and I've heard they complain about me. Why is Jess not the one to be the kick? If he'd be any other performer, they would like, get kicked. I'm like, 
You know, that's, that's, not not how that. it, that's not how it works. Yeah. You know, I don't need to prove myself on all the performer. Bring me any performer here right now. We step up, I fuck them up. You know, let's just get <laughs> this shit straight. You know, but this is work. This is something yeah, different. Yeah. You know, I'm not here to swing my dick, but don't don't perform it to anybody else. Don't 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 talk to me and compare me to anybody else either. Do you know what mm -hmm. I mean? So as I said, this this business is about being humble and try to sell yourself on the same time. You sometimes you don't really know how mm. when to do. But in all fairness, the stunt community have been so good to me. It helped me so much in my career. You know, when I started, I studied as an action extra on Thor, uh, no, on the um, Snow White and Huntsman, mm. and I met a whole friend of mine called um, Matthew Sampson. And uh, he was a young manager in the gym that worked back in the 80s. Say, hey, Matthew, we're doing you here, Jess. And he introduced me to a few stunt guy coordinator. And some of those guys say, oh, this is Jess in the UFC. Really? So, yeah. And I start training some of them. And then I work as a performer on Thor the Dark World. And, um, you know, that's where I met David Grant, you know, at the time. Yeah, stuff. Dave, such a he's lovely an amazing guy. guy. I just missed my first job. And he was so lovely to me, so helpful. Yeah, shout you know. out to Dave, Dave Grand. He's awesome. And then I stopped doing stunts because I wanted to be taken seriously as an actor. People say, if you do stunts, you know, casting director and I like it. And then eventually I realized, listen, nobody gives a fuck. You know, if you're not part of the little group, you're not part of the little group. You might as well do whatever and that's going to open other opportunity. And then, um, you know, Steve Dan, Steve Griffin, a lot of those guys, they give me a shot. They you know, they give me an opportunity and each and every job, they allowed me to do more and more. And now they know act. So now they put me forward for acting role and allowed me to do acting in front of different actors. So, you know, uh, the stunt community has been so good to me. You know, obviously, uh, the reason I'm saying that is I don't want to come across as being re resentful or criticizing people from the community. They're being so good to me and, and and I feel so, it's so much more fun. It's something completely different. I prefer acting. Acting is what I like and what I feel the most challenging. But what I do like about the stunt community is this fraternity. Is mm -hmm. We're all here for each other. Yeah. And we, we got each other backs. That's yeah. it. You know. Yeah, that's a huge one. Especially if yeah, if you have that feeling, it's it's like a feeling of acceptance and belonging of this yeah. tribe, and everyone gets each other. It's we, awesome. we were doing three three weeks of night show. It was very cold. It was like up to minus four degrees. But with that group, you know, it was like George, who's a new performer, is very good, six foot four, very amazing guy. You know, Errol was there. Yeah. You know, Sonny was there, and you you know you're all in. On the same time, it's yeah. cold, you lie on the floor, you know the camera is not on you, we're laughing about it on the same time as being stressed. Uh, we're eating together. I mean, this is very fun, you know, yeah, I really yeah. love that. Yeah, yeah, that's beautiful. Yeah, and unfortunately, I don't think that you can get that among actors. Like, um, no. you know, if you do, that's very rare. It's very, it's very competitive as actor, you know. It happened yeah. to me before a couple of times. Then I've heard it in because I read books about movies. You ask me about books. I don't read books, but I read a lot of books about movies, and I've heard those stories. It happened to me a couple of times when the actor opposite you fucks up. You know, pretend not to know his line, so you perform badly. Oh. And when the camera is on them, they know they're fucking lying. So it's, it's a doggy dog world. People will do anything to be in front of you, talk to the director and say, oh, I think Jesse should sit down in that scene. I don't think he should stand up. And they try any things like that. And yes, sometimes stunt performer can be competitive, but I don't think they kind of also like some mm -hmm. actor can be. It, if it is, it's very rare. Mm -hmm. it's, yeah, it's, well, it was very rare. Um, for acting wise, um, can, do you have your, one of your, like, what is your favorite part you've played so far? Um, and then we also can talk about um, how you said, like, that's it. I don't want to be a baddie anymore. Like, <laughs> I get cast pretty much always the gangster who gets shot in the head um, and all that. And I don't want. Uh, but like for you, do you have an idea what part you would like to play? Like if there's. Listen, when you ask me about people who had an influence on me, I mentioned uh, Gary Oldman. Yeah. And if you look at Gary Oldman's filmography, he mainly play bad guys. Yeah, yeah. So there's a million ways you can play a bad guy. That's true. That's true. So I don't mind playing a bad guy. Bad guys can be fun. They got more depth to them. But is how can I play? Is Am I allowed to play differently than the same fucking bad guy that you want over and over? And so far, I've been lucky enough to be able to implement that because sometimes people don't expect it. Mm, they expect mm. a performer. You know, they make me do a tape. It's like, oh, this guy actually can act. All right, let's give him a shot. He arrives. I'm like, oh, you know that line of dialogue? Why is he saying that? Why in this? Uh, how about we write that? And I'm saying like, okay, this guy's for real. Uh, and now I'm start talking about the rule and how we can, and like, so far I've been lucky and people allowed me to do that. Mm. I mean, from one shot to one ranger, one shot, I rewrite 50% of my dialogue. 
And I created something that was not in the page, and the director was very happy. At the end of the show, I said, oh, you didn't know you were going to get an actor. He said, no, I didn't know I was going to get a scriptwriter. <laughs> because I started awesome. writing stuff. When I did uh, One Ranger with Thomas Jane, um, I came up with specific ideas of how I wanted my character to be, from the way he dressed and everything, the way he's going to behave. And the director was very happy with the nice. way I came up with things. And and the great actor that I, and great director I got to work with, from Wim Wenders to more recently, I mean, uh, I did a TV show called Ema Vep, and I'm doing a monologue in front of Alicia Vinkenders, who's an Oscar winning actress. And all she has to do is sit down in front of me and, and react. And I'm the one who's got those three pages of fucking dialogue. You know, so every single job has got something for you to offer. Um, and as I said, sometimes you can, you can get through them through stunts. Like when I did uh, Liaison with Vincent Cassel, you know, Vincent Cassel, I've got dialogue with him. He doesn't say shit, you know, I'm mm. Vincent Cassel. You know, Sam, I did a job last year uh, called Lift um, with Kevin Hart. I didn't play with Kevin Hart, but I played with a British actor called Burn, very good actor. And I had to do an Irish accent, and I was hanging by my feet. And mm. uh, the director was a director called Gary Gray, who's a great director, he ran some very good movie. I remember a film he did in the 90s, a gangster movie called Set It Off with uh, Queen Latifah. Um, um, very good director, and he was re really reacting to what I was doing, he was very happy. So, as I said, for me, each and every job, as long as I yeah. managed to act, there's something to, <clears throat> to be. I don't mind playing the bad guy. But what I was saying to you is if I play in smaller budget movie, like the One Shot, like the One Ranger, um, like I've done in uh, Night Fair and other things, I need to be top bill. I need to be top four, if mm. not top three. Right, you know? right, right. Uh, don't so you me. have your standards. Yeah. <laughs> I did the henchman. I did the henchman in the... Gary Daniels movie yeah. when I started, you know, uh, in the beginning and stuff like that. But now I don't want to do that now, now anymore because I'm playing lead role. I'm not asking you to give me something I haven't done, and I'm good at my job. So if you want me to be a performer, uh, what well, ask somebody else? And like I said, sometimes you don't understand. You're like, wait, well, you are performing. And I think that's a, yeah, that's a 215 million dollar movie. Uh, I got paid as a performer on that more than your lead actor. Mm, 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 mm. You know, so compare was comparable. You know. What else do you think you would like to get out of the uh, movie industry? So, stunts, acting, uh, fighting. Um, I didn't want to say stunts, but it's like more like action yeah. fighting for action performer. But then uh, script writing. So you, yeah. that's something what you enjoy. How about directing in the future? Down absolutely, the line? Yeah? absolutely. But you you don't you can you know what uh, if you don't come from a very privileged background you're gonna have to do shit movie to, mm -hmm. and I think it's acceptable I mean a lot of great actors they've done shit movie to get whatever they, you want to do I think as a director you, there's so, not so many chances you're gonna get if you manage to do, direct two or three movies in your life maybe that's only what you're gonna get mm -hmm. so you're gonna make sure that on the day you're gonna direct you need to be on point and I'm too much in love with the heart of filmmaking for me um, where are you gonna put the camera uh, what lens you're going to use, why are you going to cut right here, not there. Everything is needs to be on point. You know, I don't want to do one of those movies like we said. Right, right. Let's put 10 cameras, we're going to pick what's best. No, <laughs> not about that. Not for you. Well, that's a perfect segue uh, when I ask you about your three favorite movies, three favorite books and people. So books are standing out, but we still can talk about because you love comics and other stuff. But let's uh, let's go with the movies. Three favorite movies. One of them I remember was The Predator, which yeah. is the one, the only one I saw actually. So usually I have a little bit more time to prep, and then I watch that yeah. stuff. But didn't have much time this time. Um, so let's talk about Predator, the one I've seen. Um, so why why that is one of the the three? It's probably well, you said like it's the, it's too many to choose yeah, from. I but, mean, you know, Predator. It's, there's it's a fucking stupid question. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, three, and I'm trying to stay within the theme of what make me fall in love with cinema. And okay. I did, let's say the three, right? One was Once Upon a Time in the West. Yeah. The other one was City of God. Yeah. And the other one was Predator. Three Master of the Craft. I, there's so many other movies. I could have put Casino in there, whatever. But Three Master of the car, Craft. Beautiful movie. Mm. Extremely well shot. Very well edited. You, you don't need to speak the language. One of them, Once Upon a Time in the West, there's barely any dialogue on it. I mean, the whole story is, is, is the camera. The camera, mm. the actors, everything, the story, that's how it's been told. You can even remove the dialogue. It would still be a beautiful movie. It's all about timing. It's all about choosing the right actor. I see so many people now, this actor is on set. I don't believe in one second you play in a character. 
You try to sell it to me without fucking dialogue and what you're doing. I don't believe it one second. Now, what I see in movies is people try to recreate the movie they've seen. It's not based on real life. For example, if I see an, uh, someone making a gangster movie or an actor playing a gangster, they're redoing what they've seen. They're redoing the, the Martin Scorsese and the Al Pacino and the Robert Niro. They try to imitate that. They don't base the character on someone who's real. Mm. You know. So when you go to casting, they ask you to do that. I'm like, that's not how it works. If I've got you in front of me right now, I need you to understand what the fuck I'm going to say. Mm. I'm not going to lose my temper. If I lose my temper, I shout at you. That means I lose control. Mm. If I'm keeping calm, and I'm looking at you right now, you know I'm in control. And you know what I... I so all this shouting and doing, it doesn't make any sense. And now I see so many movies. I see people, oh, I like that shot in that movie. Yeah, but that shot meant something. We came to that shot because he shot that before, because he shot it this way. And this is, it's a crescendo. And we came to this. Now you just want to reproduce, reproduce a shot just for reproducing. Mm. Reproduce. So those three movies, they are master of the craft. They are City of God. You need to watch City of God. You know, you don't, obviously, it's, it's in Portuguese the whole time. But it's such a great movie with flashback and everything is smooth and makes sense. You recognize each and every character. They don't even need to tell you, oh, that was him as a kid. You understand it straight away with the way they shoot it, the way they pull in with the camera. Mm. It's the director of Portuguese as well. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Great movie. And Predator is, I mean, um, John McTerman, nobody has been in John McTerman mm. from Daha to anything. Nobody has been to his level. It is not because... He has nothing to do with the stunts. Or now they do, and look at the guy from 8711. Look what he's doing now. Yeah, yeah. He's still, John Wick is still nowhere near the level of storytelling mm. than what John Matterman did with Die Hard, or more specifically Predator. Mm. You know, because he knew how to tell a story using his camera. Yeah, Predator has so many, but one specific uh, cool story about how Van Damme was offered to do the yeah. uh, Predator part. And uh, first of all, he's way too small to be a Predator. And second of all, he's like, fuck this, I'm not wearing this stupid thing around me all the time. And then, But uh, the other part of the story is this. You know what I mean? If you watch the making of Predator, at one point he took a break. Mm. Everybody was getting sick in the jungle. Everybody was getting the oh, shit. shit. Yeah. Uh, it was very hot. And they decided to take a break. And that's when they re recreated the old predator, the new look and everything. During that time, then they had a break, okay? Now, during that kind of break, that in between, Van Damme managed to get into the office of Melaham Gollum and uh, convince him to sign him for Bloodsport because he said to him, I'm playing the bad guy in Predator. Mm. I'm going, what the fuck? Is it really? He asked his secretary, he called the casting and asked them if he plays the bad guy. She called. He's not like, nah, he's sending email. Quick yeah, call. Yeah. Is Van I'm playing the bad guy? Yeah, he's playing the bad guy. Okay, yeah, he's playing the bad guy. He didn't say he was on the costume. He didn't say anything. So now Madame Gollum's got a guy there who's playing uh, the bad guy. He's a new Arnold Schwarzenegger movie. Fuck yeah, I'll sign you up right now. Free picture deal. Bang, there we go. So now he's got a movie. Now he doesn't know because he's on the costume. But now Van Damme's got to go back to the jungle under a fucking stupid costume. He's already thinking ahead, I'm going to be the star of my next movie. So now Hoodie wants to be fired. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, it was hot. Yeah, it was a pain in the ass. But also because he knew he had another movie waiting for him. And he wanted to fuck off, shoot another movie. That's also part of the reason yeah, for it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I understand. I think I would, uh, what Van Damme did, I probably would do the same thing. Yeah. I was like, you know, why, why would, why would this happen? Um, interesting fact. Well, not fact. Like the, the, the latest uh, Predator, which came out. Have you seen it? The last yeah, one. Yeah, Prey. Yes, uh, Prey. So the guy who is doing the, uh, the costume, who is in the costume, uh, he's I forgot his first name. The last name is Strauss. He's a Latvian mm -hmm. as well. And I met him in Vancouver, in Canada, on a dancing competition. I was, uh, I was hip hop dancer, and he was uh, popping and locking. And he's oh, yeah? like six feet three, four like super tall guy and super lovely. And I was just like, I kind of follow his Instagram stuff. And it's like, he's doing more and more like kind of acting stuff or whatever. And then once in a while, I just notice him in like some movies. And then this one was huge for him. To That's do all that. those things are important. I know this for a while was very popular is to do all those course and training to move like an animal. Yeah, and stuff like that. it's huge. And I think the more skills as a performer, as an actor, the more of those skills you have sometimes, the better it is. I mean, Ollie worked on a movie uh, recently that I'm not going to name. And, and you asked my specialist then, Ollie's done a whole bunch of different things in his life. And they were trying to figure out how certain animal would move. And Ollie would come up with things because he's done various different training. Mm. And the director, we like, he's, oh, yeah, 
You know, it might not move like an animal, like that specific animal, but it's very interesting. It kind of remind you, you know, because yeah, it makes yeah, yeah. It, So sometimes the more of those skills you have, the better it is. You know, you know whatever you can find online and try well, different listen, things. And like you said, break dancing or whatever. This is yeah, great. that's for me like one of the main reasons. Um, so you don't know about my background. Like I got my master's degree when I was twenty four. I uh, tried to do the corporate ladder, but very quickly realized this is not my thing. And But since I was a kid, I just loved to do a variety of things. I would be dancing, I would be doing karate, I would be playing football, I would be swimming, all these things. And in stunts, the beauty of stunts is that we can do anything, all of these things. Now I'm actually learning how to do a backflip on ice skates. I got a coach, I'm like learning technique, and it actually doesn't look that difficult. So we just need the right equipment, right setup, and, and I hopefully can do it in the last next couple of weeks. And for me, that's going to be like, oh my God, I've done something new in my life. And it's going to be, yes, you know. Um, and I breakdancing, love... I see a lot of people who come into very different sport and do breakdancing. One of my first film job was a film called Nutcracker. It was a short film for the first IMAX movie. Mm. And I worked on that and played different part. And um, there was one young black kid who was on that and he plays different part. And he was not a stunt performer, but he was a dancer. Mm. And it was very short, but very acrobatic. He could do so mm. many cool I, I shit. Think I, do, you know, do you remember his name? I can't remember his name. I know he put a lot of weight. I, I know I recently saw him maybe five years ago a video of him I was like fucking hell he put so much he has such uh, great that's not the guy. physique and very that's athletic. not the guy I know because there's I know another one but uh, but yeah very, he could have easily become yeah. become a performer and there's a French guy now who's done very well he just fought in the last Bellator in Paris and, and won at the Coleman event he trained with Cyril Diabate and Sam he comes from break dancing going to MMA and the guy is fucking amazing yeah. so break dancing uh, I don't know if he's part of the BSR thing but to think of it I think he should because should you be. learn so many skills from it from physicality the yeah. way you're going to move from reaction like I always say to people reaction I saw so many performers they can do great stuff but when it comes to reaction the reaction is shit yeah. I'm like if you can do the reaction in slow motion yeah and dancers you can do have it, that you can do it fast we'll and in dancing it's all about yeah. doing something slow and then start putting the tempo and the rhythm to it and also isolating certain, certain parts of your body yeah. that you can isolate this from that I think one of the greatest um, additions to BSR we had uh, his name is Stefan he's um from Romania, maybe you've seen him. He like uh, usually wear like funny mustache and like curly hair. He's insane moving, and like he used to do, and still probably once in a while does uh, street dancing on uh, in Piccadilly Circus. Like have all this crowd around him, just amazing performer. It took him a while to qualify, but now he's on. Now he he's stealing my job, <laughs> bloody immigrants. <laughs> Um, okay, so that's that's about movies. Let's talk about people. Uh, you mentioned Bruce Lee, yeah, uh, Van Damme. and uh, and uh, Gary Oldman. Yeah, yeah. Van Damme, Bruce Lee, and G Gary Oldman. And I like I, the and combo. I put <laughs> Gary Oldman slash Jean Paul Belmondo, which because not oh, everybody yes, yes, might yes, know who Jean Paul Belmondo is. But yeah, Van Damme, we went over that obviously. Yeah. Um, because very quickly I got bored of Van Damme movie. You know what I mean? After that, and Impact and things like that, I thought it was kind of becoming a bit boring. You know what I mean? I, yeah. just, I kind of switched off of it. But it was a huge inspiration to make me think, well, if he can do it, I can do it. Obviously, Bruce Lee was more on a martial art aspect. Even so, he was more of an actor. But he already had this philosophy of cross-training in different martial arts, which at the time was a very big mm. no-no. People don't realize that. Also, he had this charisma. And same again, he was doing movie, he was doing real fighting. So that was a huge influence. And I think... Every single martial artist all around the world at one point got influenced by Bruce Lee, so that's, that's nothing new. Uh, in the acting world, obviously the first one was Jean-Paul Bemodo. Jean-Paul Bemodo was a bit like the king of cool in France. He was mm -hmm. kind of like James Dean uh, in a way. Um, he done films over multiple decades. He was part of the Nouvelle Vague, uh, which influenced New Hollywood. And then uh, he done action movie. And his precarity is was doing his own stunts. It was generally doing stunts. Mm. It was doing from fighting to everything. He had a boxing background. He was doing some crazy things, standing in the subway in, uh, in Paris, going full speed and jumping around. And uh, it was so cool. And for me as a kid, because I didn't have this relationship with my father, this become in a way my imaginary father mm, for some reason. Yeah. 
you know. So for me, it was not only an actor and doing all those cool things, but I wish I had a dad like that. Yeah. You know. So it was a huge influence for me. And acting was obviously is Gary Oldman. Gary Oldman is such an amazing actor. And when I got more into acting, already I saw him in early movie, but when I really got into acting and learning about the craft and and understanding what acting was all about, I was like, fucking, yeah, this guy is amazing. He transforms himself all the time. He changed his voice, the way he walks and everything. I was like, it was such an inspiration for me. Yeah, when he was playing um, the minister um, of the United Kingdom. Um, uh, yeah, Churchill. Yeah, Churchill. That was insane. I could not recognize him. It was just... Uh, but that's something different. So obviously, he's got the makeup. Great yeah. movie, by the way. Great movie. I mean, I watched it at the cinema. I rewatched it um, on, on Netflix uh, not so long ago. It was like... Great movie. That's another thing I should tell people. You know, sometimes we watch movies and the first time we watch them, we're like, yeah. Sometimes movie needs to be rewatched multiple times. And the more you watch them, The Irishman was one of those. The Irishman, I think like everybody else, we all expected kind of a high pace, good tempo coming from Scorsese. And it's a very, very slow pace. Yeah, very slow pace. And I was having a couple of drinks on the same time and I couldn't quite appreciate it. And I rewatched it maybe three, four, five times after yeah. that. I was like, this is such a fucking great movie. It you is know. pretty crazy. Same with uh, Miami Vice. I remember when I saw Miami Vice from Michael Mann. And I was like, that's not a Miami Vice. I remember. I love Michael Mann. Michael Mann is a great director. And then I rewatched the film over and over and over. And I was like, oh, okay. I see. Now, this movie now, when I watch it, I feel I'm there. I feel like in, I'm in Miami. I feel the heat. I feel the sweat of being in Miami. When they're having that conversation on the motorway with this guy and telling him that his wife just got killed and he's losing his shit. And I can feel the the, the sound was so great of the motorway. And he's turning around to that truck like, and going over. I really feel like he's getting great movie. Mm. Yeah, it's incredible when those uh, movies can wake up these certain feelings in you. It's uh, and that's that's why I guess we we are in it. I mean, one thing what I struggle with is uh, with the, all the acting stuff, and always kind of struggled with the idea that um, we don't play ourselves. We have to be become something something else, and so the authenticity. But in the same time, you do wake up certain things that are actually real for you. You know, like I haven't done that much uh, acting training, but one. Uh, I love this example when um, I had to do this monologue and um, I did it in front of my coach and uh, this very like a tough uh, guy from New York, this black guy, um, <clears throat> our uh, coach, he's like, yeah, that's pretty decent. That's pretty decent, but let's try something else. Uh, and he was like, so what? He took me to the different room, set me on a chair and, and said like, pretending your hands are tied behind you. And that monologue, what I did was from um, um, American History X Uh, so there's uh, one of the monologues, this kid, basically, very shortly before he gets killed, like he kind of uh, talks about the feelings, what, what does it mean to be a bad guy, what does it mean to be this and that. And so I did this monologue, but and so he basically would say, so now imagine that this is the last thing you say before you go on a death row, before you're in prison right now, and you're about to be killed, and this is the last thing you can say, fuck me. Like, I, t my delivery changed. I started sobbing. Snot was coming out from, like, because I was literally thinking about, like, how it would feel that this is the last thing I ever can say to my to my family, my friends who would be there on a, behind the glass, you know, before you get executed. And then he who really struggles with compliments, he got up and he was applauding. He said, that's the fuck what I'm talking about. And I mean, like, all I'm trying to say is, like, this acting is there's so many the pockets of, of ourselves we can bring out. And it's very interesting. The thing about acting is a lot of things I need to figure out myself. When you ask me about what book I read, I'm like, I don't really read that much. You know, as I said, I remember the first time I ever went to school, I cried my eyes out. I didn't want to go to school and I had something with school because I think my father used to beat me up and the only time I had with my mother is when he wasn't around. And now I would go from my father to prison, which was cool, Back there. Even now, when I go to school and I see those little hooks in the corridor when you're supposed to put the jacket, it makes me feel like a chill in my back. I mm. really hate it. And I think I suffer from HD, ADHD and I couldn't really concentrate and stuff like that. At the time, they didn't know what it was. And school was yeah. very much strict and it used to beat me up at school as well. So it was it was a nightmare. So I think I kind of blocked from that. And they moved me from school to school because they didn't know what to do. But by 13, I couldn't really write or, or read properly. You know, they put me in a special school with people who were like, 
not quite there. Kind of slow. And yeah, yeah, and the teacher was like, what are you doing here? And then you're perfectly fine. You know, I'm like, yeah, they don't know what to do with me. So reading for me is difficult. It needs to, right. And as I said, because also I suffer from ADHD, so it's very hard for me to, very quickly after 10 pages, my mind starts going somewhere else. Mm. So uh, for me, it, it's difficult. To, and, and because of that, I, in my life, I always try to figure things out. Same with martial arts. I would say that 80% of what I know in martial arts, I figure it myself. It's not a teacher who said, okay, this is how you do this kick or this is how you do your submission. The best way for me to learn is to see other people doing it. Mm. And my brain clicked it, my brain, more than if you try to explain it to me. Right, 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 right. And acting is the same. I've done some classes, I've done some things, but I'm like, there's a difference between what you do at training and what you do on set. It's the same mm. with martial art. It's a difference between what you're going to do in the dojo and the way you're going to do it in fight. In fight, you need to make it work for yourself. Mm. You know? And what you're saying is fine, but I'm like, okay, but why would I cry when I'm going to go to death row? Maybe I don't want to cry. Maybe mm. I came with peace with what I did. Maybe I might not cry when I do for it. Maybe I'm, I deserve to die. Mm. And, and, and then who am I speaking to? What reaction am I going to get in front of that person? Why am I crying? Am I crying because I want to get attention? I want you to feel sorry for me. Is it a redemption? Me, mm. I need, I'm asking myself all those questions. This is why I'm one of these people who's, you know, when they said they're playing a role and they write all the story of them, them guy, mm. where he come from. Why is he like this? Is he poor? Was he rich? What is he trying to do? Why is he dressed that way? Is he trying to impress people? Or does it make me feel? I go all those information. I prepare, I prepare, I prepare, I prepare. And on the day, I take all of this, I put it in the board, I put it in the bin. Yeah. And then I act and react to whatever people, but I need that preparation. For me, I don't think, I don't take a role thinking that way. I need mm. to create this for the camera. Or I did, no. no. All the preparation is done before. And that's why I like to talk to director. Who is this guy? What am I feeling about? Am, are we on the same page? Because on the day, I'm going to make a decision on how I'm going to do things. And I'm not really one of those actors, which I can, but, oh, no, do it more like this or do it more like that. No, we, we need to be on the same mm. page here. Because we're going to shoot that shit in different sections. I might shoot the hand before the beginning, so I need to know the journey of my character. I can't just play however you want me to play on the day. Or play with a smile today. What the fuck am I going to give you that smile? Well, so I've got an option. But that's got nothing to do with what I did yesterday and what I'm going to do tomorrow. So now that shit don't make no sense. <laughs> so I understand what you want for you. But this is for me too. That's my fucking face on the camera. That's going to dictate if I'm going to get another job or not. If I'm going to keep my career. We're all in the same boat here. So we all need to mm. agree to what we're doing. I'm not just a fucking puppet. Now, I know I come across as a cunt and these people in camera are going to say, I'm not going to give this guy a job. It's too difficult. And yeah, I am difficult. Mm. I am difficult. For me, it goes beyond that. For me, I'm playing a real person in that. I, I'm not playing me. I'm playing your version of me because yeah, you are playing your version of me. I'm not pretending to smile a bit of a different way or hold my hand like that, which I, I can. But uh, when I, so re, even without doing that, you can smile and talk and do all those things like a normal way. But you might not make the same decision that that character is doing. Mm. Why is Thanos hit the spot on a lot of people? Because a lot of people, realistically, in some of the same way. It's like, yeah, you know what? If Alfred Planet would die, I won't fucking feel sorry for it. That's why you kind of understand where it's coming from. And that's why it make them people interested into that bad guy. A super evil bad guy. <laughs> evil for the sake of evil. What the fuck is that? I don't even understand what's going on. It doesn't feel like a normal guy. Do you know what I mean? Who's that evil? No. So everything needs to be based on some sort of reality. Mm. You know? And then when you got great skill, then you can start adding those slight movement slightly. But you do already work a different way when you start behaving a different way, you know? We all act in that life. When you go on the first date, you're going to act. That's not you. That's the best version of you. When you go for a job interview, that's not you. That's the best version of you. <laughs> but that's still you. Yeah? Yeah, yeah. So we're all acting in our day-to-day -day life. We, you know, we, we just a little bit more, a little bit less. Sometimes we realize, yeah. sometimes we don't realize. And and I think now people got so many images coming from different social media and people can see bad acting a lot more quick than they used to. Mm. Look how many fake reactions you go online. People say, oh, the acting is so shit. Or people do fake prank. Now people see when it's yeah, a fake prank. Fake, yeah. People see. You know, they don't know anything about it. They would have not known 10 years ago, 15 years ago, because we weren't so aware, we won't see so many images. Mm. But even when people seeing people's eyes, people's reaction, and that's fake. 
Mm. So if they can see that, they're going to see when a camera is right here on you, mate. Mm. So you might as well just play something who's based on reality or it's based on who's this guy? Why is he acting or reacting that way? It's very weird to talk. It's very strange to talk about acting. It's such a... When people who don't understand it. It's, yeah, it's, well, it's, it's, I could sense straight away like that you definitely know way more about acting than I do. But it was interesting when you said straight away, like, so why would I cry? Why would I, you know, if I'm going with peace when I yeah. die? Like, in my kind of head, it's like, well, I I enjoy to cry sometimes. I yeah. enjoy to to like kind of uh it's a it's a very amazing feeling of re re relief in, in a release like every time i watch some musicals i cry i yeah. watch a wicked or i watch a greatest showman i'm crying yeah. and then when i talk to say to my girlfriend that i want to dump her i don't cry <laughs> so it's a different things you know but um but that example what i was giving to you yeah i was like why would you cry i would I ask that question maybe i go with a piece maybe i deserve to die like that's that's very interesting like i didn't even thought about looking from that perspective yeah, I, just I, used to bring, I used to bring thing on myself i remember one of the first film i did when i played one of the main role was a film called night fair and we did some reshot and some of it is not even in the movie but when i'm having this um, argument with my wife and we're working in the street of paris and i feel very and i would take things from my real life and i was frustrated at the time i was going through some patch bad patch with my wife and i was very stressed and that's when i got my gray hair all of a sudden um, and I would take some of my personal life, taking me and put it in here and, and act with it. And it was very deep, but fucking enemy is exhausting. It's mm. very painful. It's very tiring. You can't do that every day. So I'm like, I need to find another way to act. And I can't just do that every time. I need to find mm. a different technique. And there is different technique in acting. And sometimes people say, oh, it's this way or that way. No, maybe you can mix some of them together. And sometimes you need to fake it because sometimes you got another guy that he doesn't understand none yeah. of this. He's not a real filmmaker. You know, he just wants you to smile first man is a fuck it and it's just mine <laughs> you know and it is what it is you know mm -hmm. so you are more a method actor you maslow technique like what is the as i said i think i think people would say maybe it's method i don't think it's completely method but i kind of need to stay within that mood like let's say if we don't like each other i would rather not and we speak with each other i'm not that good. some people are that fucking good cut so anyway, blah, 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 <laughs> action. And it, 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 I'm not that guy. I'm not that guy. You know, I like to cut. Okay. I'll go back. I'll get up. I'll do my thing. You know, yeah. I want to try to kind of keep that mood. You know? I, th I think I'm that guy. I'm like, I can be in one shot. Like, I'm going to fucking kill you right now. <laughs> and maybe, maybe it's a technique, but maybe also it's also a lack of technique. A lack of Could, complete I think that's my case. control. And I think that's my case too. <laughs> maybe sometimes it's an excuse, but I think it's a lack of complete control of your craft. Mm. But look, some of the best actors in the world, they are method actors and they stay within that role all the time or some sort of that role, you know, some sort of thing. Like mm. let's say you're going to do an accent in a movie. Try to keep the accent, you know, to come in on and off, on and off. You need to be fucking good. Yeah. So if you kind of stay within the accent, it's going to help you a lot more. Stay within that mood. Stay mm. within that thing. You know, as I said, I like to pick my clothes. I like, you know, and as I said, as you're picking your clothes, as you start thinking the way, you kind of start finding your character. You start working a different way. You start having a certain swag about it and yeah i'm enjoying this i'm transforming i'm playing me but not quite me mm. and it's kind of fun let's keep that rhythm one thing what works really crazy for me is as soon as i put some weird makeup on i look in my mirror i start acting totally differently yeah yeah so there's this one i was uh, doubling uh, one actor so they made me look like quite old and like this funny hair and stuff i looked in the mirror i was like i am a professor yeah, that's how I feel. Like it's like, who wants to just go in that character? Then I was working on the Wicked, uh, where I'm like this the curly hair guy, Munchkin Land, and then I want to talk very differently. It's, it's, but the mirror goes away. I don't see myself. I just talk to people. Then I just myself, and I look in the mirror. Have you noticed that by uh, with yourself when you put the makeup on and really yeah, and different? the clothes and stuff like that? That's why sometimes I have argument, and I'm always impetuous about having that discussion with uh, makeup and costume mm. and stuff like that. Because sometimes, especially when you play a performance, they don't give a fuck. Mm. They want to go easy. Let's shave that fucking head. Let's shave that fucking beard. Let's put any random shit we got left in the corner <laughs> there on you. And you're like, no, you know. Shout out to makeup. You know, we'll and sometimes, you. <laughs> sometimes it works well. But talking about that, it's funny you say you transform. Uh, another appreciation that I do have with performer uh, is the one that can very imitate the person the doubling. Mm. Like one guy that come in my mind straight away is JC when he doubled Daniel Craig. Mm. Sometimes I had to look twice. And JC doesn't look like Daniel Craig. Doesn't yeah. look like him. All right. But sometimes I'm like, 
I have to look twice because he would walk like him, he mm. would behave like him, he would move like yeah, him. Yeah, that was a bit freaky. Yeah, That's next level fucking performer right there. Yeah. And JC, not only is a good performer, but he can do that. He's, he really, really impressed me. Yeah, yeah. It's like, um, is that Daniel Craig has dots on his face? Oh no, that's fucking JC. <laughs> <laughs> but the way he moved, the way he run, and yeah, it's for very the listeners to know, so uh, nowadays and for last how many years now it's been that uh, on big budget movies when they can afford that with CGI is that uh, stunt doubles put dots on their faces and then they just basically do the face replacement or whatever it's called. Um, so yeah, if you see some shots from the set and someone has dots on their face, that means that they're doubling someone and then, then the face gets replaced. And some, some actors are so fucking bad and they only do a hey, close up. Hey, the double is doing the whole fucking movie. <laughs> <laughs> That's the other one. Listen, dude, we done like almost three hours. Oh, there you go. This has been amazing. Um, uh, right before I end, I want you, uh, I usually ask my guests, um, some bombs of wisdom. So this bomb of wisdom is for, it could be whether for a younger version of you. So now when you in this age and this time, and you can, if you would be able to talk to Jess, who is um, 15, 20 years old, what would you say? That's the kind of one segment. The other one is what could you suggest and wish or tell to people who are want to be an actor, so who want to be an action actor, so who want to be fighters? Um, so yeah, so let's start with like, what would you say to you, a younger version? Um, allow to enjoy the moment. In fighting, it's very hard sometimes to enjoy the moment. It's very hard. Fighting, you're training for weeks and months on hand. You get beat up. You sprint in the morning. It's very suffering. And then the fight comes and you get very straight. You're shitting yourself. Then after you've got to fucking cut weight and then you're fighting. And then sometimes in the fight, you have fun. Sometimes you don't have fun at all. It's a, it's, it's a nightmare. And then you win. And those moments are very short. Mm. A few seconds, maybe a, a few minutes. They lift your hand, everybody's shining your name. By the time you go in the back room, you already try to relieve that moment. Oh, have you seen when I did that? Oh, yeah, yeah. But that moment is already gone. It's kind of disappearing. And then you go in the back, then you go to the interviewer and they say, oh, good fight, good fight. So what's coming next? You know, And, and then you move on. That's, that's mm. it, it's done. The following, following day, nobody's talking about it anymore. About my Monday, we moved on. So all of this for only a, f a few seconds. You know, and and sometimes you want to try to relieve that moment, you know, and that's why you, you talk to people, oh, did you like my fight? And they're not reacting the way you want them to react because mm. they don't manage to re-give you that, that moment that they didn't have, you know. So I always tell myself, now in the movie business, don't do that mistake. Don't do that mistake in the movie. Like, don't just think about the goal. Don't just think, enjoy every moment you have. Enjoy preparing for a role. Or enjoy being on set. Enjoy doing rehearsal. Enjoy being there, being in the moment. Don't complain because they cut your line. Don't complain because this. Don't complain because now you're only in the background. Remember, you are that 14 years old kid that wanted to do that. Enjoy those moments. Enjoy those small moments when you're on set or when you're not on set, when you can just sit down on the bench with the dog Small cigar, life is very short. Take time. It's good to have goals. And the reason I am where I am today is because I was really focused on my goals. But now I realize that maybe in time, you also need time to relax and to enjoy those moments. Because now, 50 years of my life, I didn't have much time when I really share them with my loved ones, where I really take them to appreciate life. Half of my life, more than half of my life is gone. And for what? You know, now you just forgot the interest like that. Mm. Nobody gives a fuck about the fight you've done. They just did the first uh, UFC event uh, in France. And they didn't invite, with not that many French fighters that fought in the UFC. I was the second French fighter to fight in the UFC and win. So you would think I would give you an invite, a free ticket. Didn't. They didn't give a fuck, man. Nobody cares. When you're done, you're done. You know, so... Take time to enjoy those small moments in life, you know. I mean, having gold is one thing, but don't just be just driving by that yeah. and think about it. Because sometimes you don't enjoy anything. You just think about you, you, you feel you're waiting by, by by the phone, you're waiting by to get another job. And no, enjoy life. Mm. Sure. Today kids have expression, be present. Yeah. Yeah, be present, man. That's what I'm saying. We criticize young kids, and you mentioned earlier, oh, now we don't gotta push kids of going out and stuff like that. But sometimes you gotta say kids now they're a lot more aware about certain things. They talk about toxic environment, mm. they talk about having mental health, they talk about being more balanced in their life. And they are right. 
They are right. You got to say that sometimes, yeah, there's bad and good things, but this new generation, there's certain things they understand and, and we didn't at the time. So there's not only bad thing about this new generation, there's also good things. And one of those is that they're the one fighting to make sure that we don't walk in a toxic environment. And people may just laugh about it. Oh, what's toxic environment? Walk is walk. Yeah, but maybe, maybe they're right. Maybe they're right. Oh, I, I, I totally think that we just didn't know that those things exist and there were names for that. Toxic environment is horrible. I used to be one of those when I was in the office and I hated everything around myself. And then I hated myself as well. And that's toxic environment. And the same thing we can get in our new film sets. You know, you're stuck on a film set for two months in that environment. That's not cool. Listen, dude, thank you so much for being here. Thank you for all this wisdom. Thank you for all these uh, cool stories. Uh, yeah. And thank you for coming all the way to my side of <laughs> London. And thank you to, to your wife that she pushed you out. This is not London, man. This is fucking reading. Hey. <laughs> Beautiful. Nice one. That's it. All right. Blah, blah, blah. <laughs> Bruno's Podcast.